morning and welcome to the meeting. I want to let uh, any of the licensees know if you want to earn CE for attendance at this board meeting, uh, please see Dixie Van Allen. Dixie, can you raise your hand? Thanks. Dixie Van Allen at this time. This is a public meeting of the Board of Chiropractic Examiners. The date is July 25th, 2017, and the time is 9.42. The location is Southern California University of Health Sciences, 16200 East Amber Valley Drive, Legacy Hall, Whittier, California, 90604. The Board's paramount responsibility is to protect the health, welfare, and safety of the public through licensure, education, and enforcement in chiropractic care. Please be aware that this meeting is being audio and video recorded for live webcast. Please turn off or silence all cell phones. We will now take roll call. Dr. Azzolino, would you please call the roll? Dr. Heather Dane. Here. Mr. Frank Rufino. Present. Dr. Sergio Azzolino, present. Dr. Julie Elgener. Present. Dr. Corey Lichtman. Here. Dr. Dion McLean. Present. And Dr. John Rosa is absent. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rufino, can you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Sure. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Since the last board meeting, the board members and staff continue to do excellent work on the BCE. The committees are working diligently to address the action items in our strategic plan, and I look forward to hearing their reports today. I have continued to be busy meeting regularly with board staff and stakeholders. The weekend of May 19th, I was an examiner for the NBCE Part 4 board's testing, and I can assure the other board members that the exam was expertly run at my test site. Several of our board members, Dr. Azlino, Dr. Lickman, and myself, along with Mr. Puglio, attended the 2017 CCA convention in early June. CCA was very generous and provided us with a booth space in the exhibitor hall. Mr. Puglio and I spent most of the days manning the booth and answering numerous questions about CE requirements and various disciplinary policies, along with general questions about the board. We attended the lecture on chiropractic neurology given by Dr. Azzolino, and the ethics seminar. In addition, Mr. Puglio and I gave our own presentation about the BCE and its functions. The board was very well received and licensees were happy to meet and interact with board members. Finally, on June 26, I participated in the quarterly DCA director's call. I would like to thank Director Grafilo for continuing the department's outreach to executive officers and board presidents. And I'd also like to thank Director Grafilo for coming to our meeting today. Um, would you like to speak to the group? Yes, please. Uh Good morning, folks. Good morning. Nice to morning. see many of you again. Um, I know that I was able to attend uh, the board meeting a few months ago, um, probably a couple weeks right after I started. This is now my fourth month um, as director of DCA. Um, very briefly, I'm not going to repeat much of what I said at that board meeting, but um, now that I have been here four months, I've been trying to uh, spend a lot of my time uh, literally going out into the field just like I am here today at uh, Southern California University, uh, getting a better sense of um, yeah, the issues that uh, this board faces uh, day in, day out. Naturally, I'm going to be very deferential to the board in terms of uh, the keen insight that you folks have specific to the industry. But I also would like to say uh, to the students, pardon my uh, back here. Um, Dean, you can, you can okay, take sorry. that off of the if you want. Yeah, I like it. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. To the students, um, prior to me being the director of Department of Consumer Affairs, I was a lobbyist for the California Medical Association for about three years, and I had the privilege and honor of uh, being the at being assigned to the student section for the California Medical Association. Um, the fact that you folks are here today is a, gr a great indication that you have a deep commitment and genuine 
um, interest in obviously the profession outside of direct patient relationships. I can't uh, impress upon you enough how very, very important it is for all of you to really take a hands-on approach in terms of shaping the profession, um, coming to the regulatory uh, um, entity that obviously is specific to your profession. Um, I assure you that uh, doing so is not only, not, it's not only going to improve um, how you care for your patients, but ultimately it's going to help improve uh, the profession. So congratulate all of you in uh, being here today. Hopefully this is uh, not the first or the last. And um, ha with that, I will say um, a pleasure again being here. I'm looking forward to the tour that I'm going to be able to take with Dr. Skarange Scar here um, at SCU. I've learned uh, v vast amounts of information about the program in the short amount of time that I have been here and looking forward again to learning it more closely. Thank you, folks. Thank you so much, Director Grafilo, for coming. And just uh, a note for the students, uh, in case you don't know how everything's connected, all boards and bureaus in the state of California are under the Department of Consumer Affairs, and uh, Mr. Grafilo is director of the Department of Consumer Affairs, so we're very, very fortunate to have him here today and for him to show an interest in our profession and get a tour of the school. And I'd like to extend thanks also to Dr. Scaringe for having us here again. Uh, we'd love to have our meetings here. It's very successful. Thank you to the students for coming. You're the reason why we come to the school, so you can have exposure to the board, who we are, and what we do, and uh, be able to interact with us. Thank you very much. Can you have everyone introduce themselves? I can. Okay. Yes, let's have the board introduce themselves. We'll start down to the left. I'm Dr. Corey Lickman. I practice down in San Diego, and uh, I am a graduate of uh, SUHS. <laughs> I had to say that. <laughs> I'm Dr. Julie Elginer. I'm a faculty at the UCLA School of Public Health. I'm a board member, uh, a public more board member, so I'm not a licensee. My area of expertise is in health policy management, both uh, financial management, marketing, as well as advocacy. And I'm also the proud mom of a 11-year-old whose team is going to the Pony World Series in Chesterfield, Virginia tomorrow to represent the West Zone, the 12 states of the West Zone. So if any baseball fans are out there, <clears throat> you are help welcome to watch because now we're going to be playing against the Philippines, Aruba, and uh, Mexico, as well as teams from the rest of the, the country. So thanks. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm Dr. Dion McLean. I am. Uh, I practice in the Beverly Hills Miracle Mile area here in Los Angeles, and I too attended this very great uh, uh, school, uh, SCU, um, only a couple of years ago. Uh, watch it. <laughs> um, uh, and um, I'm very glad to be here. I so appreciate uh, seeing all you students out there. It's very, very important and encouraging to see you because the, you are the future of this profession, so you need to be involved. Thanks. Good morning. My name is Frank Rufino, and I am what we uh, what we refer to is a public member on the board. So there's two public members, Dr. Elgener, which you just heard, she going to the Pony uh, <coughs> National <laughs> World Series. Good for her, congratulations. And so the two of us uh, represent the public. Uh, <coughs> and uh, it just, you may may not know, you know, the board is comprised of seven members, and all seven of us are appointed by the governor of the state. And then we serve for four-year terms. We can serve up to eight years. And uh, we don't need, to, we don't have to, but we can. Thank you. I'm Dr. Heather Dane, and I practice in Sacramento, um, chair of the board. And I want to introduce, in his absence, Dr. John Rosa, who can't be here today, but he also is a board member and uh, practices up in my area in Roseville. Dr. Sergio Azzolino, I practice in San Francisco. I've been in practice uh, 23 years and uh, been on the neurology board uh, for, I believe, 19 years, 20 years, and I was uh, very instrumental in pushing, pushing for students to be able to sit for diplomate exams because in my day, as Dr. Stringe will tell you, it was not welcomed for students to take postgraduate education. 
education while they were in school. And so I'm thrilled to see all of you here. And uh, I, I don't believe education should be limited to any level. And I encourage you all to keep uh, pushing forward with your studies. And um, we're thrilled to have you. And thank you. Good morning. I'm Robert Puglio. I'm the board's executive officer. So I'm, I'm appointed by the board, and I oversee the board operations in Sacramento. And just to give a little bit of information about the board, um, we're a relatively small program. We have about 20 staff altogether, and uh, we oversee more than 13,000 licensees across or throughout California. And so um, I've been with the board for about eight years, and it's been a great experience. I've um, enjoyed working with this profession, and um, I'm excited to see um, such a good turnout. And because um, I, it's it's nice to be able to. You'd be amazed at how many licensees have no idea what the board is or what we do, even though we're the ones that issue your license. And so um, I'm glad to see people being exposed to the board early, and I want you to view us as a resource. And um, we're, we're not there to create problems for you, as some people seem to think. Um, we're, we're there as a resource, and we want to help you get your license. And you know, any questions you have, um, we you know, feel free to call the board office or um, you know, uh, go to our website for information, where, um, anything we can do to help. Marcus. Oh. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll introduce um, some of the board staff is here today. This is Marcus MacArthur to my right. Uh, he's the board's policy analyst. He, he works on all of our legislation and regulations, anything impacting the board or the profession in general. Um, Marcus analyzes all of that and makes recommendations to me and the board. Um, we also have um, Valerie James. Valerie's my assistant. Valerie um, does everything. She makes sure that um, that I stay organized and things run smoothly. She she comes a day ahead of time and gets everything all set up for the meetings. And so thank you, Valerie. And then we also have um, sitting down here we have Dixie Van Allen. Um, she's our licensing, continuing education, and admin manager. So um, the possibility you'll be when you are applying for licensure, you'll be um, interacting with Dixie. And then next to Dixie is Andrea Mendez. She's one of the board's newest employees, and she's an enforcement analyst. And hopefully, you'll never have to deal with her. So. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we'll move on to the next agenda item, which is approval of the minutes. We'll start with May 16th, 2017 meeting minutes. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Any public comment? I'll call for the vote. Dr. Dane? Yes. Mr. Rufino? Yes. Dr. Adelino? Yes. Dr. Elginer? Abstain. Dr. Lickman? Yes. Dr. McLean? Yes. And Dr. Rosa is absent. So we have one abstention, one absence. Thank you. Uh, and now we'll move on to the meeting minutes of June 14th, 2017, for our teleconference meeting. I move to approve the meeting minutes from June 14th. Second. Any discussion? Any public comment? I'll call for the vote. Dane? Yes. Trino? Yes. Azalino? Yes. Algener? Yes. Lickman? Yes. McLean? Yes. Thank you. And now we'll move on to the executive officer's report. Okay, I'll be um, reporting to the board on uh, four general areas, administration, budget, licensing, and enforcement. Um, starting with administration, there haven't been any changes since the last meeting. Um, at, as at the last meeting, we're fully staffed, which um, we hadn't been in a while. There were several transitions, and um, so at any given time, we seem to uh, not have a full staff. But now it's been almost a year that we've been fully staffed, and um, we, we have a great staff, so I'm happy to report that. Um, on to the budget. Um, again, no major changes since the last meeting. Um, just our um, 
our fund, as you know, has been our expenditures have um, gone up in recent years, and also um, revenue has gone down slightly because um, the number of licensees has um, gone down over the years. Um, so the combination of the two, we're um, we're having to increase fees, as we've discussed at um, the previous meeting. So I'm in the process of working with the legislature uh, to get a, a, a fee bill. And I'd like to um, give a little bit more information about that just because um, we want the board to understand and um, the future licensees will be um, you know, funding the board. As uh, many of you may or may not know, uh, the board is 100% special funded. That means we don't get any money from the state's general fund. It's um, all of the revenue and all, all of the money in our budget is um, comes from licensing fees. So it's the profession that uh, funds the board. And we, we take that obligation seriously, even though we're a consumer protection organization, the purpose we exist is um, to protect consumers, to ensure that anybody practicing chiropractic in California um, has the appropriate training and education and abides by the chiropractic laws. And so, um, so that's our purpose, but we take our commitment to our licensees um, seriously. We know that you all work hard and it's your hard-earned money that um, funds the board. And so we, we, um, we, always, we try to always be fair and um, be efficient. And you know, when you do become licensed, I encourage you to interact with the board. And if you're not happy with something, communicate with the board members or with the board's executive officer, if it's me or whoever my successor may be down the line. Um, you know, let the board know, and we, um, you know, we want to serve you as well and make your license experience as positive as possible. So we um, we are um, in the process of seeking a temporary renewal fee increase, and the reason we're doing that is that um, we're, we we just entered into a contract with a um, with an accounting firm that's going to come in and do a complete fee audit. They're going to um, audit all of the fees uh, that we charge, the the tasks and the um, workload involved in um, you know in delivering whatever you know say the satellite certificates. How much does it cost the board and staff and other resources to issue a satellite certificate or to issue a corporation certificate? Uh, so um, and there's various other um, minor fees that we that we charge and those haven't been assessed in a long time. So we're going to do a complete audit to make sure that whatever we're charging is in line with uh, with the cost to the board of um, you know, of delivering that fee, and that will include the renewal fee. So right now what we're doing, um, because we need a fee increase in the near future, we're seeking a temporary fee increase, and then once that's been, um, once that's in place, and once we have the audit completed, then we're gonna go back and um, address all of our fees collectively. So, um, so other than that, there's, there's really nothing uh, significant to report with the budget um, at this point. So I'll move on to uh, item C, which is um, licensing trends. And um, as you can see, it, we're, we currently have, as of June, the end of June, we have 13,191 licensees. And, and just to give uh, the students some perspective, um, back when I started with the board, um, and I started in 2009, we had 13,812. And uh, in prior years, if we go back, we had even more licensees. So, um, so over the last couple of decades, the number of licensees in California has declined. And so you know, we're happy to see uh, students entering the profession, and we hope that that trend turn, uh, turns and that we have more people going into chiropractic and becoming licensees. So um, thank you all for choosing this profession. Um, and that's no recent changes in licensing, so unless anybody has any questions, I will move on to enforcement. And we're, we're at the end of the fiscal year, so the, the handout that's in the packets, it's um, compliance unit stats, it gives historical data going back to fiscal year 12-13, so you can compare, um, this gives you information for anybody who's interested on um, the number of complaints we receive in a given year. This year we received 490 complaints related to chiropractic 
and and then it gives the um, the outcome of all of those. So if if you look down, it's like how many complaints are still pending, how many were closed for insufficient evidence, and so on. How many citations we issued this year, accusations, and um, this year we revoked uh, ten licenses, which is um, if you if you look back, and that's relatively high um, number, and that's just um, that's something that. As you're entering this profession, I want you to be aware of there's there's a lot to know, and there's um, you know most the vast majority of our chiropractors are great and don't violate the laws. Some um, some individuals violate the law intentionally. Others via, you know, commit violations that they weren't aware was a violation, and that's where we want to be a resource and educate all of you. Um, you know, if there's there's a lot of things that you can avoid um, having to deal with being disciplined for um, for minor violations, and so uh, we we do have a lot of resources on our website. Um, you know, that we have a list of the top 10 violations that we see, just to let you know things that um, we see most commonly, and hopefully those are things that you can avoid. Um, and there's uh, quite a bit of information on our website, so if um, none of you have ever been, I encourage you to visit our website. And I'm going to shut up in a minute, but I um, just want to make a plug for our social media because you're all young and I'm assuming social media savvy. So I'd like you all to um, go to our website, join our mailing list, um, there's a link for join our mailing list and you just put in your email and then you get updates from the board. When we have new meetings, if there's a change in the law, anything um, that we want to get out to all of our licensees and other constituents, um, we, you know, we send out email blasts. Uh, we also have a Facebook and Twitter account and we try to put uh, relevant information on there and we're, um, you know, we try to do that frequently. So I'd encourage all of you to, um, you know, join our social media, either Facebook, Twitter, or both. Um, like it, share it, tell your friends, and um, hopefully that'll help us to disseminate information to the profession. So, thank you. Just a quick question. Do you have any um, updates from the... You have to hold it close. There you go. You can hear me. <laughs> um, just a quick question regarding an update with um, Breeze from last meeting. Was there any new um, yeah, um, information? What Dr. McLean is referring to, it's called Breeze, and it's um, it's a database that the entire Department of Consumer Affairs is switching over to. As um, as Dr. Dane mentioned um, previously, there's about 40 regulatory programs under the department. Um, and we, we all do similar work, but for different professions. Um, the department regulates everything from medical doctors, nurses, accountants, um, barbers and cosmetologists, um, cemetery and funeral providers. Uh, so, um, so we're in with uh, you know, all these other professions. And um, so we share a database, and that was a huge undertaking for the department, but they ran into problems, and we were in the third release of the new database, and we didn't and get in there. So, um, so we're still using the old system, but we're working with the department to um, determine our needs and get us into Breeze or a similar database. And um, right now, we're, um, we're still we're doing a lot of background work to prepare for that. Um, so we're in the process of process mapping. Um, every process that we do at the board so we can determine what our business needs are. From there, that'll um, enable us to determine what our IT needs are and find a system that'll work best for us. So we're probably, um, we're probably about a year out before we're able to um, get into a new system. Did that answer your question? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, do we have enough for... Okay, for those of you who have iPads, or um, the, uh, the meeting materials um, can be downloaded from our website. Uh, we, we did have um, copies of the meeting materials out front, but um, I've been told they're, they've all been taken so far. So um, if any of you are here with um, friends and you can share, um, that's great. Um, otherwise, if you're able to, you can access the materials on our website. And that's... Um, what is it, Cairo.ca.gov? www.cairo.ca.gov. And for 
for, for those of you that do have materials, uh, Mr. Puglia was talking about uh, enforcement and uh, enforcement cases. You can, you can see a graph on there that by far the code that's violated most is uh, 317, and then in the packet is a breakdown of every, that's unprofessional conduct, and then it, there's a breakdown of everything that falls into unprofessional conduct if you're interested in that. Any other questions for Robert? No? I just want to say one last thing to um, to the students. Um, throughout the meeting, at the end of each agenda item, we have um, a public comment um, opportunity. So if you have any questions or want to make comments about anything the board's discussing, I encourage you to um, come up and take that opportunity during the public comment periods. And now is one of those public comment. Any public comment about uh, the executive officer's report? There is one other. Uh, go ahead. Oh. Come up. Can you come, come up to the mic so everybody can hear? Right here, right here, uh, to the here at the table. <laughs> and let, let us know who you are as well. My name is Peter Jenkins, and uh, I'm a retired uh, recovering attorney. Uh, according to my wife. Uh, my question uh, that, that, that was struck me as interesting is, has the board looked at and determined why uh, chiropractic licensing has uh, decreased over these years rather than increased? And is the board doing anything about trying to increase licensing? We, uh, we've, um, there was, um, back uh, more than a decade ago, there was a, um, dramatic um, decrease uh, in the number of licensees and um, I, there were probably a number of factors contributing to that, um, economic and otherwise. We don't, um, ever since then, the, it's been gradual. So um, to answer your question, um, we don't know. Um, there's, it just, it, it just seems that more people as, uh, through attrition, as people are retiring and leaving the profession, there just aren't as many um, new licensees coming in. And so we, um, we hope that that, um, that that changes and that more people become interested in going into healthcare and choose chiropractic um, as a profession. But we don't have any one factor that we can point to that's um, a determinant in why the numbers have gone down. Certainly, I think that has a lot to do with a uh, decreased enrollment in the schools also. So it's not just a factor of decreased licensees in California. California does have more licensees than any other state or country. Um, but there has been a decrease in enrollment, so I think there's a variety of different factors that Dr. Syringe and many of our educators would probably be able to point to. All right, we'll move on to number six, ratification of approved license applications. I'll move to approve the list of approved license applications as provided by board staff. Second. Any discussion? Any public comment? Call for the vote. Dane? Yes. Rufino? Yes. Azalino? Yes. Algener? Yes. Lickman? Yes. McLean? Yes. So for the students, this is a list that someday, hopefully your name will be on, meaning that uh, they are soon to be licensed and they have their license numbers right next to their name. Agenda item number seven, ratification of approved continuing education providers. Is there a motion? A motion to approve the list of continuing education providers. A second a motion. Any discussion? Any public comment? Call for the vote. Dane? 
Yes. Rafino? Yes. Azzolino? Yes. Elginer? Yes. Lickman? Yes. And McLean? Yes. All right. Number eight, ratification of denied license applications in which the applicants did not request a hearing. There are none. So we'll move on to nine. Occupational analysis presentation by Heidi Linzer Hill, Chief Office of Professional Examination Services. Um, yeah. um, she's, um, she'll be here a little later in the meeting, so um, she wasn't able to be here at the beginning, so we told her we would just okay. take this agenda item up when she arrives. All right. For those of you that were here, there's been an extensive occupational analysis um, done by OPES that there's going to be a presentation on. Um, so it should be, when's the last time we had? It's been a while. It's, since it's been quite a while analysis. since, I mean, we, we don't know, um, I don't know that California has ever done its own occupational analysis. I've been with the board for eight years and this is the first occupational analysis we've done independently. The National Board of Chiropractic Examiners, which administers the, uh, the licensure exam, they do an occupational analysis for the, for the entire country um, every five years. And so occupational analyses have been done, but, um, but we've decided to do our own. And um, w the results, they just completed that. They're analyzing the results. And um, uh, Ms. Linzer will, when she arrives, will um, give us some more information about that. But um. and for those of you that have the meeting materials or are accessing them online, there's ex an executive summary in the notes about the occupational analysis that you might want to look over. Yeah, and there's there's the um, the occupational analysis document is um, quite thick, um, and, but this is available on our website as well. So anybody who's interested, this this te you know breaks it down. This is an extensive process to do an occupational analysis, and um, and it breaks down the profession by tasks. What exactly does a licensed chiropractor do in daily practice? And um, so it's the you know once the all the results have been analyzed and compared with the with the national occupational analysis, it'll be very enlightening for us to see what your doctors doing in California as opposed to the rest of the country. And so um, I, I look forward to completing that process. All right, we'll move on to the next agenda item, number 10, a uh, presentation by Peter Jenkins uh, about the Pastoral Medical Association. It's okay if I leave the mic at this distance for a minute? Oh. I, I'm sorry, sir. I'm, do you want to give a little background to the, to, about pastoral yeah. medicine? Um, uh, just um, for, the, for those of you, um, and, and perhaps uh, Mr. Jenkins, I could ask um, you to do this, to, um, to give uh, the students here in the audience um, a little background about the Pastoral Medical Association and, you know, and what um, your role is in healthcare and so on. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to do that. And hello, everybody. I'm sorry to have my back uh, to you, but I prefer to address the board if I can. Um, we received a letter from the board uh, inviting the Pastoral Medical Association to attend a public hearing and to explain the functions of the, past the structure and the functions of the Pastoral Medical Association. And that's why I'm here uh, to respond to the board's uh, invitation. And in the context of what I'll talk about today, I'll explain what the Pastoral Medical Association is and my hope and desire is that by the time uh, of our presentation uh, conclusion that the board and those here in the audience today uh, understand what the PMA is all about and it comes to see the PMA as an organization that is really very supportive of and uh, uh, supplementing, complementing the uh, mission of this uh, board with respect to chiropractic. And I'll explain that as we go forward. Sure. Is that better? Yeah, that's good. All right. Uh, so it, it's my pleasure to be here, and, and the Pastoral Medical Association 
uh, is very appreciative of the opportunity to have this uh, time to uh, present at a public meeting what the PMA is all about. Uh, my name is Peter Jenkins. As I mentioned, I'm professionally trained as an attorney, uh, graduate of the University uh, of Virginia, uh, honors graduate, I have a master's in trial advocacy from Georgetown University Law Center. I have decades of experience as a litigator, and I'm very, very proud to say I'm no longer practicing law. <laughs> I, uh, uh, my wife, as I mentioned before, my short comment uh, refers to me as a recovering uh, lawyer. And uh, in retrospect, uh, I think I might have done better in the healthcare profession, but uh, so it is. Uh, the last few years of my practice have been totally dedicated to health advocacy. And I'm involved in a number of initiatives nationwide uh, to advance uh, uh, health advocacy, and I deal on a daily basis with many leaders in the chiropractic uh, profession, particularly many of those who are practicing functional medicine, as is uh, Dr. Azzolino. So um, I want to mention one project at the outset that may be of interest to, the, to this board and, and its members, and that is I'm spearheading uh, a, a, an initiative uh, to create a health freedom advocacy organization. Mr. Jenkins, I'm looking at the students' uh, body language, and I don't think they can hear you. So I need you, and I want to make sure they can sure. hear this presentation. Is it better if I hold the mic like this? <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. So um, I want to mention this, this one project, and I think it serves the board's interest, and I think it'll serve the interest of many chiropractors in the state of California uh, and nationwide, and that is uh, we're spearheading uh, the formation of a health uh, freedom uh, legal services team. And the National Health Federation, which as the board may know and some of the students may be aware, the National Health Federation is the oldest in the world health freedom uh, organization. And uh, as some of the board members re may recall, in the 1960s when chiropractic was in a battle trying to establish its right to be licensed, the National Health Federation went to uh, work and supported chiropractic licensing in over 40 states nationwide. So the National Health Federation, in conjunction with the Pastoral Medical Association, the National Center for Life and Liberty, which is an individual rights constitutional uh, uh, legal representation organization, and the Minneapolis-based National Legal Research Center are in a collaborative effort to form this uh, legal services team, health advocacy legal services team. And the goal is that these lawyers across the country in every jurisdiction will be go-to legal counsel for integrative and functional uh, healthcare uh, practitioners to help them uh, establish their uh, businesses, uh, to be compliant with the laws of the states that uh, they're uh, dealing with, to help them integrate their practices if that's of interest to them, to deal with their client base and, and, and so forth, but to have a knowledgeable base of attorneys that understand the regal, uh, legal regulatory challenges and dynamics that are occurring in the country today. And I mention this because I, it's part of what my, my hope is here today that the this board and those in attendance at this hearing uh, and those that have the opportunity to watch this recording in the future uh, gain an understanding of what the PMA is all about and really most importantly to view the PMA as an organization that is totally complementary to what's uh, occurring in the country today in terms of health uh, evolution uh, and services and also as supportive of this board's mission. Um, so with that, let me give you a little background about the Pastoral Medical Association. Uh, the PMA is an established ecclesiastical organization. So ecclesiastical refers to uh, Christian-based uh, or of and relating to the Christian church. In this respect, uh, the, we're not referring to any particular denomination of the church, but to Christians in, in general. And so the PMA is a Christian organization, and it's on a mission. The, the members of this organization, the founders of the organization, are healthcare uh, professionals and others who believe that the church should take a broader role in healthcare and that the church has stepped away from its traditional role in healthcare uh, for a number of reasons, but that it's important to reestablish that role. And so, what we're talking about in terms of healthcare from a religious or spiritual supporting standpoint is natural healthcare procedures. 
uh, that are supported by uh, scripture and not contrary uh, to scripture. So the PMA serves as a missionary arm of this Christian uh, church. And quite simply, it's an organized effort uh, by a group of Christians to provide humanitarian work focused around what I've explained uh, to do uh, that uh, I've mentioned before. The PMA, uh, in this context, licenses health professionals and its licensees collectively represent every area of conventional and alternative healthcare practices. So PMA licensees include uh, healthcare practitioners that have medical licenses and chiropractic licenses, acupuncture licenses, uh, naturopathic licenses, uh, and uh, people in the healthcare uh, profession, uh, in, including um, uh, therapists and nutritionists and every imaginable aspect of healthcare, these people seek uh, PMA licenses, and I'll explain why that is uh, in a moment. Excuse, excuse the interruption, Mr. Jenkins. Sure. I just want to make sure that um, the board members have enough time to answer, ask questions after you're finished. So um, if we could be timely about the presentation, you know, we have about you know another 10 minutes or so allotted. Uh, to keep on time with our schedule for you, and then, then we'll have time to ask questions after that. Uh, okay, I'll, okay, I'll try to speed through this as, as quickly as I can. Thank but, you. Uh, these are all foundational, and I'm sure these questions, uh, what I have to say here will be uh, supportive of the, of the board having uh, insightful questions. So the, the PMA has this uh, uh, mission, to, as I've explained it, but it also goes uh, further than that, and that's important, I think, for this board to take notice in light of its mission, and that the PMA is focused on doing everything it possibly can uh, to support and help eliminate uh, the epidemic of chronic illness that is facing Americans and our citizens today. So what functions does PMA uh, perform in doing this? Well, we license uh, spiritually-minded healthcare professionals to provide pastoral science and medicine, we promote those licensees practicing safely, effectively, and helping them grow their practice. Uh, the PMA has, a, on a, as part of its primary functions, uh, the uh, activity of connecting uh, uh, its licensees with uh, the public, uh, people that are interested in having natural health care services, and also in marshalling both clinical and practice development resources for uh, its practitioners. Uh, if you said to me, Peter, what is uh, pastoral science and medicine, my answer would be to you that this is a term used to uh, describe collectively the system of pastoral counseling and other services uh, founded upon spiritual principles that PMA licensed practitioners are uh, promoting to improve the physical, mental, and spiritual health of their clients. And uh, the, the way clients of PMA practitioners achieve uh, health gains is by making adjustments in lifestyle. Uh, and it's important to understand not only what pastoral science and medicine is in this context, but also to understand very clearly what it's not. And PMA requires its licensees to describe that, and in this context, the Pastoral Medicine Association license does not uh, intend uh, to or suggest on any level that it is trying to authorize the practice of conventional medicine. Its licensees specifically disclaim that, that they're not treating, diagnosing, evaluating, curing, attempting to treat, diagnose, or cure uh, conventional, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, disease or illness, uh, but rather, uh, and also that they do not, like the chiropractic profession, they do not issue prescriptions for uh, drugs or or uh, medications, nor do they counsel any of their clients in terms of decreasing the dosage of drugs or medications that they may be uh, prescribed with. So in that sense, the PMA licensee works with the uh, providing medical physician. So how are PMA licensees different in general than other healthcare providers? Predominantly, it's because they're on this, this religious uh, mission uh, to move uh, healthcare uh, uh, beyond uh, uh, what it is today and to help address this uh, epidemic of chronic illness. So it really all boils down to the fact that the PMA and its healthcare practitioners are this Christian organization with this uh, religious uh, mission as uh, I've explained it and they're helping their patients by achieving homeostasis, returning the body to uh, uh, balance from dysfunction and deficiencies so that the body can heal naturally 
and in that way address the chronic illness that we're facing. But uh, as I, as I, I want to take just the moments that I have left here to look at the PMA and the role of this board from three different perspectives quickly. Um, because, and we'll come back to the board's mission in a moment. This board has announced its mission on its website that its, its intent is to uh, protect the health, uh, welfare, and safety of the public and to do so through licensing and education and enforcement of the chiro uh, chiropractic pr profession. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. I also want you to know that what I'm about to say has got, I'm at no level intending to criticize the medical profession. Uh, in the state of California or otherwise, or any other healthcare profession, but we have got a problem. And the problem is that with roughly 323 million people in the United States and 39 and a half million people uh, here in California, as the CDC, is the Center for Disease Control, has recently announced and looked again, the largest cause of death and disability in this country is chronic illness the largest cause of death. In 2012, the CDC concluded that there are 117 million adults suffering from one or more chronic uh, illnesses. And uh, if this uh, growth in chronic illness that we're now experiencing at all levels and all ages continues, it's projected that by, by 2025, we're talking about just eight years from now, that we're gonna have 49% of the people in this country uh, suffering from one or more chronic illnesses. In that context, it absolutely breaks my heart that the chiropractic profession, and particularly, is not seeing uh, an exponential growth in members. And the reason I feel that way is because the medical profession is not solving that problem. So you break that down into these chronic conditions, heart disease, stroke, cancer, type 2 diabetes, chronic, uh, you know, morbid dis uh, disability, uh, obesity, and arthritis, things like that. Uh, we're talking about 164 million Americans within the next eight years are going to be suffering from one or more uh, chronic illnesses. If we translate that into California, we're talking about somewhere between 14 to 19 million people. 13,000 chiropractors divided into 14 and 19 million people. You're talking about 1,100 people per chiropractor suffering with chronic illness. Yes. And the interesting thing about those people is they're not saying to themselves, I need chiropractic assistance. They understand that they're not getting what they want from the medical community. They understand that more drugs and more prescriptions are not the solution uh, to all of this. But at the same time, they don't have a mental perception of what chiropractic can do to help them. And uh, the other thing that's, I think, uh, pertinent to, to this, this point is that uh, Johns Hopkins, as you may know, recently did a, a, a research report, and the third largest cause of death in this country is not disease, it's medical error. The third largest cause of death, medical error. So the other angle that I want to take a, a look at the health and welfare and safety of the public that this board is, is advancing is. Okay, so the, the so my, my, I will thank you. My, my next point is how are we doing? The answer is not so well as hey, Mr. I, Jenkins uh, indicated on that front. Just one second. Sure. You're speaking to a group of chiropractors here. I think we all may share your philosophy when it comes to health and wellness. And um, certainly the students here don't need another philosophy class. Mm -hmm. It would be very helpful for us as the regulatory board to better understand what the mission and the, uh, the um, entire organization of PMA, PMA is doing to, uh, number one, license individuals, and number two, deliver health care to individuals and to protect the public in the, in the meantime. Yeah, so let, let, let's, let's, take that, let's take that on. I want to take a look at the uh, mission of the board in that, uh, you know, the mission of this board in that context. Uh, my question, and, and it's not criticism here, again intended, but I'm wondering if the mission of the board uh, to protect the safety and the welfare and the health of California citizens doesn't encompass doing something about this health care crisis that we've got going. The board talks in your strategic plan of 2017 to two, uh, 2019 of communicating to the public the evolution of chiropractic. 
my hotel room last night. I went on online and I looked at the strategic plan and I searched disease and illness. I looked at the uh, description of chiropractic to the public. I looked at the description of the chiropractic profession. And those words, disease and illness, don't appear in there. There's mention of evolution of chiropractic, but where is that coming from in the context of the board? And again, I just want to throw that out. It's not a criticism of the board, but I'm saying that I think you would see huge numbers of increases in licensing chiropractic if more uh, members of the public knew and understood that chiropractic can address chronic illness and change the perception, involve the perception that chiropractic is more than adjusting the body physically to remove physical supplications, su uh, supplication. And what's happening, to answer your question, uh, Dr. Apolito, is, is that, and, and, and you're seeing this, and, and you, you yourself, sir, are, uh, are an example of this, having taken postdoctoral training in functional medicine. What we're seeing across the country is that chiropractors in large numbers are turning and taking training in functional medicine. In large numbers, they're taking training in functional uh, uh, nutrition and diagnostics. Uh, they're taking training in functional uh, neuropathy. And just like your practice, uh, sir, the, you know, where you have integrated uh, with a naturopath, where you have integrated with a medical doctor so that you can treat a broader need uh, of the individual patient, it's not so easy for other chiropractors to do it. And in, in, under the chiropractic laws of this state, certainly nutrition and diet, things like that can be uh, supplemented, but it needs to be supplemented with a chiropractic plan, not standalone. And again, you've got public people wanting natural health solutions, but they don't view chiropractic as providing uh, those solutions. So uh, that's uh, what I would like to uh, finally address with the board. And to answer your question, Dr. Azzolino, the PMA is licensing chiropractors to provide pastoral medicine and science as a separate profession. Our constitution allows us, obviously, to practice multiple professions. So we could all become dentists if we wanted to, or you could become lawyers if you so choose to go down that path. But similarly so, as chiropractors, you can choose to take additional training. Uh, you can choose to become functional health care practitioners, and we're seeing that nationwide. And it's because uh, what we're getting is feedback from chiropractors that uh, their adjustments aren't holding the way they used to. They're seeing less and less miracle adjustments occurring. And they're asking themselves why, and they're recognizing that chiropractic is complementary to, uh, uh, it's a system complementary to how the body operates. Now these chiropractors are taking that training, and let me answer your question as to why they're coming to the uh, Pastoral Medical Association. Let, let, let me ask you a, a more pointed question, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, how many licensees do you currently have? I'm not at liberty to share the full number of licensees, but we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of licenses. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Is that upwards of 500, upwards of 1,000, upwards of 200? It's upwards of all those numbers. No. No. I think, so sir. In, in an effort of transparency, as you can see, the functions of this board is to be very transparent. We have accurate numbers to, to, the, to the one of how many licensees we have. We have very accurate numbers and um, uh, you know, our, our enforcement efforts are very transparent that everybody could take a look at how many cases have been uh, you know adjudicated how many cases how many licenses have been revoked as mr pulio stated part of the problem that i'm having understanding here is, is not your philosophy your philosophy is right in line with the reason why most of us got into chiropractic but i really don't have any idea of what the pma does it's not very transparent in regards to how you're licensing people. Um, you can't even give me a, a direct answer of how many licensees you have and, and how many of those licensees that you have are chiropractors versus other practitioners, do you know? Hundreds. Sir, how many I, unlicensed healthcare that you consider healthcare providers do you have? The, well, approximately, how many people uh, do approximately, not hold a, I'm sorry, how many people do not hold a, a DC license? How many people do not hold a DDS license? How many people do not hold a DO, an MD, or an LACC license? Approximately half of PMA licensees are state licensed, and approximately half are not state licensed, and they encompass 
spiritual counselors and health coaches, and they encompass naturopaths that don't need to be licensed across the United States and other professions. They encompass uh, practitioners who practice under the health safety laws of the country like that of California. So do you feel it's appropriate for an unlicensed individual to interpret lab tests? Uh, depends on the background and training. Do you feel it's appropriate for an unlicensed individual to not only interpret lab tests but actually render some sort of counseling regarding that test if they are, in fact, unlicensed? Uh, yeah, the, the licensing, you know, you license somebody, does that make him a good, uh, a good practitioner? And the answer to that is no. No, I think that makes them qualified the to do, basically qualified to do so. The PMA reviews the educational criteria as part of its application, reviews the educational criteria of each applicant. That includes chiropractic applicants. And based upon that review and the background check of these people, it provides a license to practice natural health care. Then the question becomes, you know, is are they competent in their skill sets? And the PMA monitors that just like this board monitors the competency of, of their uh, your chiropractic licensees. Okay. We could give you a very accurate representation of how we monitor individuals. Can you do that for us, please? This is where the problem lies, and the reason why we invited you here is that there is no transparency on how you're assessing people's level of competency, and a license is to show people's level of competency. We can't get that about the PMA. We, we get a lot of philosophical things, and personally, having been in practice for 23 years, as you know, I have an integrative clinic. It seems like many of the PMA practitioners I have interacted with seem to try to circumvent the licensing boards out there, and in my personal, and this is not uh, uh, on behalf of the board, but in my personal interaction with many of these people, they seem to be very incompetent. Well, and, uh, and that's concerning when we're dealing with patients that uh, are, are seeking guidance and, you know, and, and someone may be presenting themselves at what's called a functional medicine practitioner, which I do not represent myself as. I have training in functional medicine, but all of my credentials are board certified um, and they're, you know, approved by the United States Department of Education. Yeah, so the, the answer of competency is the, in, in applying for a PMA license, the practitioner, and there are two levels of PMA licenses, one is the diplomat of PMA licensing, the other is the doctorate. Uh, in order to obtain a doctorate of pastoral medical and science, they have to have an education. Can you speak up a little, please? They have to have an educational background as a uh, healthcare professional equivalent to a doctorate. So they need to have a doctorate degree in chiropractic, they need to have a doctorate degree in medicine, they need to have a doctorate degree in whatever level of healthcare they want to be certified as a doctorate. So they have to have that level of education. So we review that educational background. There is also a test now to become, uh, being implemented to become a PMA uh, licensee. There's, so they, get, they go through. Is implemented or is implemented? Being implemented. It's now being implemented. And who oversees that testing? The pastoral, the, uh, the administrative staff of the Pastoral Medical Association. Is there is any there external body that, that accredits that? Or is it all self-accrediting? No, it's all, it's all self-accrediting. But that doesn't, you know, so you, let's, let's take, for example, you know, you, you talk about competency and it's a very subjective uh, situation. You may be aware that uh, a couple of chiropractors, actually, who were PMA licensees, uh, were arrested in California not too long ago. And they were charged with practicing medicine. They were charged with practicing medicine without a license. Now, is that this board's fault? Is that the PMA's fault? The PMA had reviewed on, upon complaint and, and uh, withdrawn the li uh, revoked the licenses of those people two years before they were arrested. But they were arrested. They were chiropractors. They were also prior PMA licensees charged with practicing medicine without a license. Are we criticizing this board for having licensed those people? Of course not. Right? So the PMA uh, manages and oversees the uh, competency and the uh, uh, practice of its licensees the same way this board does relying number I one take except on that, Mr. Jenkins, I'm sorry for interrupting you here, but you do not have any you cannot cite anything on how you're overseeing things. This board has this board has we has implemented procedures that are available to everybody that you've seen. We've had an extensive occupational analysis. We have testing. 
We have, it, it's all overseen by various agencies. We have a, a parent agency, the Department of Consumer Affairs, that oversees things. And so you can't compare the PMA to the chiropractic board and say you're overseeing things the same way because we'd like to see, number one, have, how do you oversee and censor advertising? We, we review the uh, advertising of our licensees, particularly upon complaint of any, any party, of any board. And do you know how many complaints you've had in the last year about your association or your members? Yeah, we've, we've had probably under a dozen complaints. Okay, and how were those dozen complaints handled? Uh, they, were, they were reviewed by the uh, administrative staff by looking at the website. The, the PMA has a scope of practice just like the, uh, the chiropractic board has a scope of practice. We rely heavily on our practitioners being self monitoring as does the as does this board uh, so they never become uh, subject to investigation but if there is a complaint by a member uh, of the PMA if there's a complaint by any member of the public if there's a complaint by any client uh, those complaints are taken by the administrative staff investigated fully and disciplinary action is taken there's a whole set of procedures on how that's done excuse me And, and who are the administrators? I'm sorry, to piggyback on your question, you're, are, do those, how many administrators do you have that are reviewing these um, things? Are they acting as a board, and who, who are they? Yeah, typically complaints get reviewed by PMA's internal legal counsel and external legal counsel. And how many people are on this the, the PMA has one internal legal counsel and hires the law firm of uh, Gibbs, the Gibbs Law Firm, which is multiple lawyers. Uh, to uh, as external legal counsel and the Gibbs Law Firm and the internal PMA counsel uh, review complaints and take appropriate action on them. So the complaints are reviewed against the standards of care that the uh, PMA licensee must follow the rules, regulations of PMA and against the scope of practice. And if it's determined that the uh, licensee is in violation, non-compliant with the uh, uh, PMA rule regulations or scope of practice, uh, disciplinary action, and to the extent necessary, a revocation of license is imposed. So it's a very, a very formal uh, procedure so it's, it's in the licensee. Uh, so this, these administrators, this internal and external legal team, those are the ones who also oversee or approve the license that are, as you as stated here, are received and reviewed and investigated. Those are the same people that are doing that the, the legal counsel doesn't get involved unless there's uh, issues uh, on, on the application that so needs who, to be reviewed, but the, the PMA that? has an administrative staff that, that is assigned to review licenses and to uh, do background checks on each of the individuals that are licensed. And how many people are on this administrative staff handling these hundreds and hundreds of? There, there, are, there are probably five people. Uh, total. Are they appointed, elected? No, they are, uh, they are neither appointed nor elected. They are uh, employees of the Pastoral Medical Association. And, and do you have public meetings? Uh, are your financials? Uh, no, that, you got to remember, uh, Dr. Asolino, the Pastoral Medical Association is a uh, religious organization. So it's like, you know, if I were here representing, uh, you know, the, uh, a, a church, and you said to me, you know, say a large Christian church, Southern California Christian church, and you said to me, uh, you know, what, what's, your, um, what's your budget? Is it public? Is it publicly reviewable? Most the large churches. So, but the church is isn't dealing with people's health care Right, so, so may I just offer something? Yeah. Sir, um, my doctorate is in public health. I'm not a chiropractor, okay? I truly represent the public. Mm -hmm. Here's my concern, and I, I just want to ask this. <clears throat> in reviewing the materials that were provided as well as on the website, it was very clear that, and I quote, that the goal was pastoral advice and not health advice. That's a published quote from the website. Pastoral advice and not health advice. Coupled with your comments about the fact that it was chronic disease, and you mentioned tremendous amounts of chronic disease. I'm a public health practitioner and researcher and publisher around chronic disease. So if really this is about natural health care and it's not involved in the practice of medicine or diagnosis or treatment, why is the word medicine in the title? As a, as a member of the public 
who is largely, not me, but who is unable to determine and distinguish that component, the differential that you're describing, in my opinion, it is grossly misleading and completely unprofessional and downright wrong to have the word medicine in the title of the organization unless you can publicly provide all of the documentation that we are asking for and more. So you would be equally critical of the Institute for Functional Medicine? You'd be equally critical of the Functional Medicine University? Neither of which have anything to do with traditional, conventional... I would ask the same questions that I'm asking you, sir, which is around public health protection. Yes. But the Institute of Functional Medicine, which I know quite well, does not issue licenses. Correct. That, that the, is the rub that we are having. So, but the, but the license is a pastoral license. Uh, very respectfully, the state of California nor this board has no jurisdiction to judge a religious organization. Sir, we're trying to understand. You started the conversation saying it's complimentary. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Show us how it's complimentary by showing us the statistics around how you license, how you monitor, how you ensure competency, how you take action, and so forth. And then let's have a conversation about complementary. Because without that, in, it, it's not complementary. Well, that's, uh, you know, very respectfully, uh, that's your conclusion in terms of the word complementary. The use of the term spiritual, excuse me, uh, pastoral science and medicine is based on scriptural definition. Medicine is used in the context of scripture. I would love to quote scripture with you, but I don't feel that that's appropriate now. I'm trying to ask and ascertain the public protection component that goes along with the organization to which you're describing. Well, that's, that's, you know, that's where we stand on this uh, issue. The Pastoral Medical Association, as I've explained to you, has both internal and external legal counsel, has a competent administrative staff, we review, you know, and, and I can point to you chiropractors of, of national repute that are licensed by the Pastoral Medical Association, and what they're doing is they're separating their chiropractic practices from their pastoral medical sure. practices in order to be able to provide a, a greater service than what their chiropractic licenses uh, uh, involve. So when you say they're separating their, their, their practices, then uh, can you give me an example of what that looks like as far as, as a chiropractor, I, I know what the scope of practice is as a chiropractor. Right. So you're saying that as a pastoral medical licensee, their scope is just pastoral medicine, which consists of counseling, as, am I correct in, in that? You have the scope of practice in the materials that's been handed out, right? So yes, these, and there's, and they, I'm still it, unclear. It includes counseling and providing uh, advice. It includes uh, uh, suggestions on uh, lifestyle changes. It can, it, can, it can include the use of uh, uh, specific uh, uh, procedures and, and uh, protocols for uh, detoxification, for stress, for stress reliefs. It can include uh, uh, providing supplemental recommendations for nutrition. So it's, it's, it's completely separate from uh, chiropractic. It proceeds under the banner of the Pastoral Medical Association. They disclaim any uh, practice of conventional medicine. They enter into written contracts with their clients. Remember these, we, we've got all these people that are seeking natural health care solutions. Right? And they're looking for people that uh, can be responsive to that. A lot of these people uh, like very much the idea that they're going to receive uh, health care advice from practitioners. So, so let me just from, ask you, I'm sorry, to you, because uh, I want to be clear of what your interpretation is as, and, and in comparison to what mine might be. Sure. What is your interpretation or definition of natural medical solutions? Nat that you're referring you know, it, to if you If you were to say to me, uh, Peter, t tell me about the practice of uh, pastoral science and medicine. What can a practitioner do and not do? What does it encompass? My answer to you would be that the practice of pastoral science and medicine is very close to what uh, is defined as traditional nat naturopathy. Very close. With a couple of qualifiers. And the qualifiers are that the practitioner uh, sees and views his or her professional pursuit in, the, in their career 
as a spiritual religious mission. And number two, as they look at their, uh, what they can do, traditional natura naturopathy, for example, as I'm sure you're aware, does not involve use of medications and, and there no advice is, is given uh, relevant to decreasing uh, drugs and medication. Uh, it's natural health care solutions that uh, are involving in, in adjustments to diet and, and uh, nutrition, exercise, rest management, stress management, uh, all the practices that allow the body to come back into homeostasis so that the natural capabilities of the body to fight disease and eliminate disease can be uh, triggered, and, and that's, that's what's occurring. So, for example, if a chiropractor, licensed chiropractor, is living in a state where nutrition cannot be part of the practice, or they're living in a state where the registered dietitians have managed to obtain a law that says only registered dietitians in the state can diagnose and, and treat nutritional uh, conditions, and that chiropractor has taken functional medicine training or, or functional diagnostic nutrition, now, how can that chiropractor practice? They turn to the, assuming they're spiritually oriented, they turn to the, the, the Pastoral Medical Association. They step over and they're saying, this is my religious belief, my religious right. It's protected by the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, as applied by the 14th Amendment to, uh, to the states. And in, the, in this state, under my pastoral license, I can provide natural health care, think of it again as traditional naturopathy, and, and the, the government regulations, the medical board in that state, the chiropractic board in that state, the dietitianary, the, the nutritional dietitian board in that state cannot look across that uh, constitutionally protected religious line. So okay, why so not why call it that organization? Why not call it then the Pastoral Natural Health Association? Why, why not? Because that is very clear natural health, homeostasis, all the things that you've described, stress management, natural health solutions, no medication, no devices, that's very clear to the public. The, the, it, it's, it's misleading to have the term medicine and the related techniques and associations and training as part of it. I don't think most, I think most of us would have a much uh, better clarity if the organization was called the pastoral Natural Health Association and the supplemental services that would be provided. Well, thank you. I mean, I'm happy to pass that recommendation along. I wasn't around when the nat when the organization chose its name. Sure, but you, just like you, you came here today, Mr. Jenkins, asking questions of why is the chiropractic board not doing? I'm saying why is the natural why is the pastoral medical association calling itself medicine when you have clearly stated that that is not your intent okay well I, i'm happy to take that board to, uh, back to the as a recommendation to can the i come to the meeting and also make the recommendation publicly I'll, I, i'd be happy to introduce you directly so the 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 uh I, i'm happy to make that recommendation i want okay? to go also. And, i would like to go the, Fine, I'd be, I'd be happy to introduce the board, to the, enti the entire board to the PMA, and that's why we were pleased to be here. So they remember the other part of this, though, is that the other stronghold uh, of law that exists in this country and is one of the strongest uh, foundations is the law of contracts. And every PMA licensee, whether they have a medical back, whether they're medical doctor licensed, whether they're chiropractic licensed, whether they're uh, a, a naturopath that isn't required to be licensed in a, in a given state, every licensee of the Pastoral Medical Association enters into an agreement of wellness services, which you have in your packet with their clients, which reveals exactly what the PMA is. They get a clear distinction that they are not practicing conventional medicine, so they eliminate that. They disclaim any treatment of uh, uh, illness and curing and, uh, of disease and so forth and, and the use of medications. Dr. Jensen. So you get, the, you, get the, excuse me, you get the contractual relationship in addition to the religious protection, and these people, the clients that are coming to them, and they represent hundreds of thousands of people. So do you, I'm sorry, do you, go ahead, um, go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I have a few questions actually based on, because um, so, you, um, one of the things you said that your organization does a background check on all of, um, uh, what kind of background check? Um, we do, we do police type investigation background checks on, on the standard of the individuals to see if there have been complaints against them in, in, in other, by other uh, health healthcare okay. boards to see if they've been charged with crimes and so forth. We look to make sure that they have 
clean ethical professional background. All, all of our licensees are required to be fingerprinted okay. before we issue a license. All of these students out here, when they apply for their chiropractic license, will have to get fingerprinted, and we'll get um, California Department of Justice as well as FBI. So um, any crime they ha may have committed anywhere in the United States will be reported to us. Um, you know, uh, private entities don't have access to that. Um, kind of information, so you can't do a thorough background check, and that's part of our consumer protection mission. Um, we also have an enforcement program. Um, more than half of our budget, our annual budget, goes into enforcement. We have um, analysts and investigators. So if we get a complaint from the public, we actively and thoroughly investigate that to make sure that if it's one of our licensees, that they um, are in fact competent, or that you know, if there's an accusation of sexual misconduct or of negligence, um, we investigate that, and if we find out that um, there's a problem, we can discipline the license and potentially revoke it. And you know, whereas we we have something, you know, if you take away their pastoral medicine license, that doesn't take away their ability to practice what they're doing because what they're doing doesn't require licensure. Anyways, we we can take away their license, and they they're not able to practice in California. Um, you know, the other thing is, you mentioned that if a chiropractor is in a state where um, the nutritionists have an, a monopoly, and you know, and they say that only a nutritionist can do this, this, and this, um, you're suggesting that the chiropractor can circumvent the state licensure law and practice nutrition under the pastoral medicine. Um, guys, that wouldn't, I don't know about other states, but that wouldn't fly in California. If we have a chiropractor and uh, they're doing something that is legally within the scope of practice of another profession and not chiropractic, they can't do it. They, um, you know, so, and we will discipline them for that. And um, my, my final comment is more of a question, is as a consumer, how would I know um, if I go into a chiropractor's office, and they're also a pastoral medical doctor, um, how do I know whether they're practicing chiropractic or pastoral medicine? And we've run into this in enforcement cases where the chiropractor will tell us, um, I wasn't practicing as a chiropractor. And when we get the complaint from the consumer, I wasn't practicing as a chiropractor, I was practicing as a pastoral medical doctor. Well, the consumer sees chiropractor, and they know that chiropractors are licensed by the state, they know they're required to have certain education, um, and so that, that gives them a level of comfort, you know, and knowing that this profession is regulated and that there are safeguards in place. Um, you know, but then if all of a sudden somebody tries to pull the rug out from under and say, oh, well, no, you can't go after my chiropractic license, um, you know, to me, that seems like an effort to circumvent the regulatory laws. Yeah, well, let me address that, uh, Mr. Polito. The circumvention, when you, when you start by saying circumvention, what you're um, not considering in the picture of all of this is that there is no need and there's a religious protection of not needing to be licensed by state secular regulatory authority. So it's not a matter of circumvention. The PMA license doesn't purport to uh, uh, expand or restrict the scope of the uh, chiropractic license in any way. The PMA license stands on its own through its own uh, constitutional uh, protections of the United States. So if, if, if the PMA license and, and PMA licensees practice in every state of this country, and the only time the PMA licensee has ever been, uh, uh, light, the PMA license has ever been challenged was by the chiropractic board of the, of the uh, state of uh, uh, Kentucky. Kentucky. Excuse me. Kentucky. Kentucky, Kentucky as indicated in, in those materials. And within a few months of discussion around that, the Kentucky board said, no, we recognize that chiropractors in the state of Kentucky can be separately licensed by the Pastoral Medical Association, that this is a pastoral practice. And that's the distinction. It's not a matter of circumvention, it's a matter of having another license. It's it, like if you, so want, if you, sir, wanted to become a minister, yeah. uh, this board yeah. can't tell you not to become a minister. But it, is it then um, separate? For, so if it's, if it's separate, so if I'm a chiropractor and I'm also a, a, a pastoral medical doctor, um, do, do I do both practices in one location, and how does the how does the consumer or the patient know that um, when you're practicing chiropractic and when you're practicing pastoral medicine? Right. And the answer to that is the the, the practice and, and the rules and regulations of the Pastoral Medical Association require their practitioners to completely separate 
That means separate appointments, separate charge, separate records, separate display of the pastoral credential, separate contract with the client to understand that this is not part of their, their medical practice license or their chiropractic or their acupuncture license. This, this service, this appointment time is being uh, given to you. These, this counsel and this advice is being given to you as a pastoral medical counselor. And the client signs a contract to that in writing at the beginning of the relationship. Okay, so um, final question. I know the board members have more questions. If um, So we, I have seen, um, as the executive officer of the board, I have seen um, chiropractors' advertisements that, you know, they're advertising their chiropractic practice, but then at the bottom it says, um, you know, pastoral medical doctor or some acronym to that effect. Um, that would be a violation of your... Um, rules, correct? Uh, because they're they're advertising them together. They're because um, based on what you just said, they have to be completely separate. They can, so so they shouldn't be when they're advertising as a chiropractor. They shouldn't be indicating to their chiropractic patients, "I'm a pastoral medical doctor too." Well, I'm. I'm, I'm would this board criticize uh, a chiropractor who's also uh, uh, an acupuncturist? from running a chiropractic ad and mentioning his LA secret. No, because they're legally licensed in California, in California to perform license. those two well, professions. The PMA, the PMA license is equally legal as equally a constitutionally protected legal license. Not, it doesn't yeah, require but, state authorization. Yeah, but you you just told me that they that they're completely separate, that they're required to keep them completely separate separate advertisements. So, so, so separate um, appointments. So if they if they represent their credential as a PMA licensee, as a as a PSC doc D, for example, a doc doctorate of PMS, then the, the, the PMA regulation requires that that uh, credential, uh, the letters, be also linked to and explain what the licensing authority is. So if that ad is going to be compliant with a PMA uh, uh, licensing regulation, it needs to reference the Pastoral Medical Association. But uh, the, the ad is going to be reviewed on its own based upon uh, the PMA regulations. So if you've got a chiropractor out there that's advertising that, you know, he's got a PMA license, but he's got a chiropractic ad out there, and he's representing that he's uh, uh, treating thyroid, uh, Hashimoto's disease, for example, then that, that ad would be reviewed from a PMA compli uh, compliance standpoint and criticized, just like it would be reviewed by your board uh, about uh, an appropriate advertisement by a chiropractor. So. Mr. Jenkins, just yep. to summarize, what I'm hearing you say is that your PMA licensee's constitutional right is to practice some, some forms of health care and aren't required to be regulated, licensed, or trained for those. They're not required to be regulated, licensed, or trained by any state authority. Are you concerned at all in vetting their training? We do vet their training, Dr. As so, as a so with all due respect, don't. All, all I'm asking for is a little transparency on what your procedures are for such because I haven't met anybody yet that can give me that answer. Well, uh, let's, let's be specific. If you, if you applied to the PMA for a license, you would be asked to complete a, an application form. You'd be asked to identify your educational background, all your certifications. And, and training and background, and the PMA would uh, verify that you have the licenses, that you have, you have the education you're representing you're okay. having. They would Sorry. verify that you did indeed get postdoctoral training in functional medicine. Right? With all due they respect, would they would I, I'm not they concerned would, about the, the half let, of the members. Can no, I, but can, I, can I, I answer this question, please, no, just for a moment? Just one moment. I don't think any of us are concerned about the one half, as you described, the one half of the members who also hold medicine license for medicine, for RNs, for acupuncture, for chiropractor. I think the concern is in the other one half, as you described, that do not hold any licensees uh, for state regulated licensees in healthcare. So how are they evaluated? That's what our concern is. So uh, may I ask, answer your question in the context of uh, uh, another question in part? No. In California. In California, are there health care practitioners that can practice in the state without a license? M Mr. Jenkins, answer, we're asking you specific questions, this, this and state, you're answering us with questions, which doesn't I'll, I'll, help us. I'll answer her question. But in this state, people can practice health care under the, under the 
uh, health care freedom laws of this state. There are people that can practice health care without a medical license as long as they provide disclosures to their clientele. Uh, they need to provide in writing and get a written acknowledgement uh, under the health freedom laws of this state that they are not practicing uh, medicine or a licensed practice, and, and that can go forward. There, there, our our there purpose are, is public protection, and I think we're, we're, we'll have to agree to disagree on that. On that, I have one final question to wrap this up. Okay. Um, so you said that when you look at when people apply and you look at their training, um, you make sure they have training, but not you stopped yourself short of making sure they have licensure. So would the PMA would the PMA certify uh, a practitioner who had had their license revoked by their regulatory agency? It's possible. Okay, thank you. It's, it's possible. And then, and then just- let me, let, may, no. I, may I qualify, no. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's possible. If someone t uh, 10 years ago had their license revoked by, by a, uh, uh, for, for whatever reason, the, the PMA will, uh, you know, will will look at an individual's background, their history, their track record, and take all of that in consideration as to whether they should or should not be uh, licensed. They do an extensive background. We have people then, that are very capable of looking at uh, medical and criminal uh, criminal records, and we do that. One so, one final comment in your um, scope of practice, it says uh, that your pastoral medical association they're not allowed to do things that are considered unsafe as supported by scientific evidence has been negatively publicized by the press and or would bring governmental action against the licensee or negative publicity to the association so what mr. Puglio, uh said was that people practicing outside of their chiropractic scope would bring some kind of governmental action against the licensee. That is in your own scope of practice, yet you're saying that that wouldn't be a problem for a PMA doctor if they had regulatory action against them for practicing outside their scope. Oh, oh, not at all. Okay, not, that, not that's all, not what your scope of if, practice if this, says. If it's, and this is this occurred, and we have boards across the country that contact the Pastoral Medical Association and say, look, we've received a complaint uh, you know, about this, this licensee. Uh, of the Pastoral Medical Association. That licensee may or may not be licensed by a medical board or a chiropractic board. If this chiropractic board- That's even more board, problematic. If this, well, if this chiropractic board spots uh, 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 an off the reservation activity by uh, a chiropractor licensed in the state and that chiropractor happened to be a pastoral medical licensee as well, you would you would do you would do your investigation separately. And we but what would, I'm saying is your scope so says well. that the, your 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 licensees are your your uh, your members are not allowed to do things that would bring upon them regulatory action or adverse action, government action, and yet right. it would. No, so no, I'm sorry. If, if this board this board took a regulatory action against a chiropractor, a licensed chiropractor, and it was, it was under investigation, and it was determined, and, and this board contacted the PMA and said, we're, we're investigating this chiropractor, and we believe he, he or she is acting outside the, uh, the scope of their practice mm -hmm. or beyond the standard of care, mm -hmm. then the PMA would begin its own independent investigation of that licensee from the standpoint of the pastoral medical, medical From the standpoint uh, of the license. PMA. Okay. But if we share your religious beliefs, there's no need for me to even be certified by the PMA then. And in this idealistic world that you're saying we could hide behind religion, many do, there should be no need for any laws of the land. I mean, well, I, I, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> it, what, are you criticizing the Constitution of the United States, Dr. Azzalino? The Constitution of the United States. Yeah. I mean, it's here to protect individuals. Yeah, and it, and it guarantees the freedom of expression, right? So if the only, if the, uh, if the only protection that we had was state laws, uh, it, it, our, our Constitution would be vacuous in part. People, people can practice religion without a state license, and that's the beauty of the Pastoral Medical Association's capability is to authorize qualified healthcare practitioners to practice natural medicine. And by the way, you know there there hasn't been any actions uh, legally that I'm aware of 
in the last years that I've known about the Pastoral Medical Association where any client has accused any uh, pastoral medical uh, uh, doctor of a uh, harmful action. I just thank wanted you, to you. say, uh, just one last thing, promise. Um, when will your next meeting be held? Are those, can you let us know, can you tell us now what your scheduled next meeting is and are, is it open to the public? Uh, the PMA does not hold regular uh, meetings that are uh, open to the public, but I'd like to, again, extend an invitation to any member of this board that wants to contact the principals of the Pastoral uh, Medical Association to do so. I'd be happy to provide uh, the direct uh, invitation, and I'd be happy to enter into dialogue and provide additional information about licensees uh, of the Pastoral Medical Association. and, and uh, that also hold chiropractic licenses uh, around the country and, and open the dialogue. Thank, thank think, you for I your think, time. I think I'm ultimate, in it. may I make just one conclusionary sure. statement? I think ultimately if this, if this board were objectively uh, to look at the Pastoral Medical Association in depth, to look at some of the chiropractors nationally, internationally renowned chiropractors who were also uh, pastoral uh, uh, medicine licensees, uh, that you would find that really what's happening here is that the Pastoral Medical Association is supplementing this board's mission. And it's supplementing this board's mission because the PMA has at its foundation this desire to address the chronic illness epidemic that this country is undertaking. And we're, we're expanding and evolving the scope of the Pastoral Medical Association's license in order to have people uh, have natural health care that restores homeostasis and addresses the problem in a natural means. But the and means think, of this I board is public protection. We, we applaud your philosophy, um, but uh, as far as the public protection mandate that this board has, I think we have some we have some I, I disagreements. Agree. I would really like to see this board take responsibility for protecting the health of Californians who are suffering from chronic illness and who are suffering at the hands of medical thank uh, you medical uh, thank you for your uh, time negligence thank you mr jenkins thank you, thank you so much thank for coming public comment yep. i'm going to open it up for just a minute we're going to take a break after this but i was going to open it up for public comment as a Uh, Mr. Jenkins, you have public, public comment, comment if you want to. Oh, well, this is not a question and answer, though. Just oh, no, comments. just public comment. Yeah. No. All right, thank you. you Maybe it's more, it's more of a, I guess it's kind of, You're on. It's kind of a question. Um, so getting educated on this and seeing that we're trying to figure out what, what the PMA board is doing, can we make, um, do we have to go through CCA legislation? What do we have to do to protect ourselves so to your point that there is a separation so that chiropractors know since we can't change really what they're doing more of what we are doing I'm so, are, sorry, are you a student or are you a licensee or um, no I'm a chiropractor you're a chiropractor okay yeah. um, so you don't have to do anything to protect yourself I mean unless if you if you were to become a member of PMA um, then you know you have to understand because we we have jurisdiction over the chiropractic license and, um, and, and you know and the chiropractic scope and so you want to make sure you don't violate any of our laws. I don't no I mean I don't want to not discriminate against I don't have an interest in doing that I'm I'm a chiropractor board certified neurologist and I went over the thing that Heidi's going to talk about with the scope and I know it says it it acknowledges like ACA and ICA certifications and whatnot. Uh -huh. But it's specific in there. Can we put, what do we have to do to, I don't, I can't remember all the binders that we went through, like scope of practice or whatnot. What can we do to say, if you have in particular a PMA, these are the regulations that you have to abide by, like a corporation name have and have your last name in chiropractic in it. There, there's, um, you have to abide by the Chiropractic Initiative Act and our regulations. So if, if anything you do, regardless of what association it may be under, if anything you do um, is in violation of the Chiropractic Act or regulations, um, then you're subject to our jurisdiction. So, so in using an acronym, 
we, we have specific provisions in our laws that say um, how you identify yourself as a chiropractor. And, you know, such as if you refer to yourself as doctor, you also have to clarify that you're a doctor of chiropractic. You have to use DC or chiropractor. Right. And so, you know, so, um, so we can't give you specific legal advice at this, uh, in this meeting, but, um, but I would just say make sure you're clear on what the chiropractic laws are in California. I understand that. I'm asking for it to be in writing in particular to PMA. The, I'm not clear at all what your question is. So I Mike, think she wants to know how do you get the word out what the difference is between a DC license yeah, and PMA Yeah, so if we can't if we can't change so, their licenses. Chiropractors and, and the patients. public. The whole point, right, is that you guys protect the public. So one of the questions was separating advertising business name that's not, that's not, our, our, that's not our suggestion. That's Mr. Jenkins suggestion. Right, but I can suggest you only you only adhere to one law that is your chiropractic license and that's it. That's all we could suggest. So I wouldn't suggest adopting or we're not endorsing anything he is saying. That was his opinion. He's entitled to his opinion, but I would stick to what the Chiropractic Initiative Act states and how you represent yourself and don't worry about what everybody else So says. doctor getting the word out to doctors, other chiropractors and patients, that In would probably be something that would be more suited for the professional associations to do so in through CCA, CCA would be or ICAC. some yes. sort of cuz I think that's what you I think that's what you're asking. Um, yes. in yeah, order for board to take action it would be something regulatory which is a much much yeah. much much longer process. Okay. Yeah, we have that no was, jurisdiction over the PMA or any of their licensees, unless they're also a chiropractor. Then we're looking at your chiropractic practice. So we, we just, um, you know, so whatever you do, if you join other associations and stuff, that's none of our business unless it becomes part of your chiropractic practice and you commit a violation um, of our laws. So. Which is what I understand. I was just yeah. looking for a line of demarcation to yeah. separate in particular from PMA yes. in the chiropractic laws since we can't change what they're doing. Right. That makes sense. Yes. We don't need to it separate does. ourselves from every profession and every okay. organization out there. We could just tell you these are what the chiropractic laws and guidelines are, and that's it. Okay. Just work within those confines, and you'll be fine. I was just trying to find a solution to this yeah. circle yeah. that we <laughs> just entered. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Any so other comments? Come, you if you have public that. comment, why don't you come on down so that we're. Okay, okay. go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going to have to interrupt. Um, those, those are questions directed. Th this isn't a question and answer period. Uh, you know, it's, it's public comment. If you have questions for the PMA, um, I would recommend that you contact, uh, Mr. Jenkins may give you his contact information, um, and you can contact him directly and ask um, those questions. He was, he, uh, he was invited here by us to come and answer the board's questions because some of our licensees um, uh, are also um, pastoral medical doctors and advertise as such. And um, and so, and we've also um, been aware of non-chiropractors doing um, you know things that are within the chiropractic scope, um, you know, under the um, PMA association. So, um, so that's why we invited him here to answer questions. Um, but if you have questions for him, you can reach out to the association directly.
that that word means um, for our purposes that word in and of itself isn't a problem if you know you um, we have laws um, regulating false and misleading advertising so if somebody puts something an acronym next to their name like say medical doctor or physician or so, um, and that misleads the public if you're a chiropractor and you're misleading the public to thinking that you're a medical doctor um, you know then that would be problematic um, you know saying that you're a pastoral medical doctor um, you know there's nothing yeah that that gets because that somebody could think that that's the same as a medical doctor and so um, so it's possible that somebody could be misled but but we don't have an issue necessarily with somebody saying that they're a member of the PMA or something but you know as long as they're not doing anything that's a violation of our act you know so if um, you know if we are, do become aware of a violation um, you know, then then we'll investigate to determine whether, in fact, it did violate our law. But but in and of itself, um, referring to yourself as um, a pastoral medical doctor isn't a problem. Just one more, yeah. The, uh, the PMA is not an educational institution. We, we understand that, Mr. So Jenkins, and we're, we're going to leave that we're, comment we're, as it is, and if they would like to speak with you on the break, we wouldn't do that. We're going to take a break now, and uh, if you'd like to stick around and answer individual questions, we're going to have 10 minutes. We're going to take a 10-minute yeah, break, and then you can that, talk to people individually. This is going to be the presentation on the occupational analysis, so you might want your packet. If everybody can take their seat. Sergio, do you need this? Do you need yours? I don't know. Do you want it? I just want to make sure if you need it, you have it. We're going to move back to agenda item number nine which is the occupational analysis presentation <laughs> by Heidi Linzer, uh, Chief Office of the Professional Examination Services. Validation and development 
for DCA sports, bureaus, and committees. And um, we also make recommendations based on regulations, professional guidelines, and technical standards related to the licensure examination. So, licensure examinations must provide a reliable method for identifying practitioners who are able to practice safely and competently. We talked a lot in the last presentation about public protection. Um, the purpose is focused on energy level tasks and knowledge important for public protection. This is our uh, cycle of examination development, all the steps that we do to develop an examination, and not just us, these are um, based on um, professional standards and guidelines for any kind of licensure exam development. And at the top is the occupational analysis, it's the most important piece of data that is used for all the rest of the examination development processes. And so how do we determine those entry level tasks and knowledges? We uh, do the occupational analysis, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. Um, there are many re uh, reasons why we do it. It's required for, for your board, um, for all boards and bureaus under DCA, required by Business and Professions Code Section 139. The occupational analysis needs to be done every five to seven years. And um, it's also required by our professional standards um, and guidelines for licensure examinations. The, the guidelines state that we have to have a thorough and explicit definition of the content domain of interest. So we can't just sit down and write a bunch of test questions that we think are relevant. We have to first do the background research to determine what, um, what are the important content areas of your profession. And so the occupational analysis is that description of the tasks and knowledges that are required for a safe entry level practice. The results of the occupational analysis um, are an examination outline. And we're going to go through that as the rest of the presentation goes on. And um, the examination outline specifies the content areas uh, that need to be covered and how many questions um, for each content area based on their importance to the profession for which to practice. So once uh, we have an examination outline, the next um, step is writing test questions, and this is all done with um, the assistance of subject matter experts who are licensed chiropractors. And um, we, we review um, write items, we review items, and we determine the passing score for the examination. And uh, then we also, once the test is administered, we perform statistical analysis to see how well the test is performing. And then the process starts all over. That's why we need to take a swivel cycle um, every five to seven years again to start with the occupational analysis. Things don't stay static in a profession. Things change. Things become go out of practice. New techniques may come in. So we, um, we always get it. That's why our standards recommend five to seven years. So more about the occupational analysis. It defines the practice in terms of actual tasks that new licensees must be able to perform safely and competently at the time of licensure, the essential knowledge required for a safe and effective practice. Also, provides a description of current practice, provides the basis of job-related fair and legally defensible examinations, establishes examination validity, the linking of the examination content to the critical job competencies, and provides the basis for legislation and policy. A lot of professions and medical professions have overlap of practice that different um, medical practitioners can do some of the same tasks. Looking at the occupational analysis gives you good information to determine are our practitioners doing some of this overlap work that other practitioners are doing. It's a good, it's a good way to get a glimpse into that. Also provides qualitative and quantitative data to support the licensure of the profession. Why is, why is this, these things on the test? Because people said in the occupational analysis that they were important or they were um, done frequently. So the occupational analysis can help ensure there are not artificial barriers to licensure. There shouldn't be anything on your test that isn't covered in the occupational analysis. And the OA process also improves transparency by providing specific examination information that candidates need to know in order to be licensed. So the students who are here are I'll be happy when the new examination outline is released and we'll tell them what they need to know to study for the test. So the focus of the occupational analysis is on public protection. Um, we need to identify the tasks, as I said, that entry-level licensees must perform. 
place fun activities than an entry level practitioner, a person who's ready to practice independently, but who may still learn additional tasks on the job. So the process that we went through to um, do the study uh, started with telephone interviews and research. Um, we reviewed the, um, any information that we had on the chiropractor's practice. Um, we conducted practitioner focus groups and um, I'm going to call them workshops. So if I say workshop, I say it's focus group, but a group of um, licensees who we call subject matter experts. Um, we developed a survey listing um, all the tasks and knowledge that, um, during the, that we collected during the practitioner uh, focus groups. We conducted data analysis on the survey results and then conducted additional practitioner focus groups. To achieve reliable results, process requires involvement of licensees, so like I said, with diverse practice backgrounds, work settings, practice type, and geographic regions. So that they, they introduce an initial focus groups. They provide um, complete and technically accurate coverage of the job content. We ask our, um, our participants in the focus groups to identify tasks performed, identify the knowledge base necessary to perform the tasks, and identify demographic variables, and then we develop a survey based on the, on the collected information. We administered a pilot survey initially to make sure that all the taxonologists were covered and were understandable, and then we administered the final survey. So the survey was sent to 5,000 licensees um, out of a total population of 13,261. Um, the chiropractor sample was proportionally stratified by a year's license County of practice with oversampling and developed licensees. We tend to insert in our surveys get more responses from people who are licensed 20 or more years, and um, we deliberately oversample the practitioner zero to five years so that we can get more um, input from them because they're the closest to entry level that we, that we get. Um, so, our response rate, overall response rate was 8.6. However, after we went through the data and all the data is not always usable on a survey like this, so the um, response rate was uh, 6.6%, which is pretty low. Um, we, we like to get, our, most of our surveys, we like to get 10%, but it's very difficult nowadays, as I'm sure you know, when you get on the far into surveys, online surveys, and people are less likely now to fill out surveys as they used to be. But what's important for us is that the, um, the sample is represented in key areas that are important to um, our evaluation So the final practitioner focus groups, they evaluated the results of the surveys, they looked at the demographic characteristics of the survey respondents, and also determined preliminary content area rates, they confirmed task knowledge linkages, and they developed the description of practice and the examination outline for the law and ethics exam examination. So, the SME reviewed the tasks and knowledges, and they indicated which tasks go with which knowledges. Um, and this linkage is a critical part of our process that we do. It's required by our standards and guidelines to make sure that every task has an associated knowledge, and every knowledge is associated with the task. And again, it's to, to confirm that everything we're asking is important for practice, and that we're not just asking some knowledge in a vacuum that it has to be linked to performing an important task in the profession. So the link, and then the linked tasks and knowledge are used by item writers to ensure that test questions are also linked to the job analysis. The test questions are then, by that process, linked to the job. So all licensure examinations, the test questions should be job related. So demographics of the survey. Um, we use those to describe the respondents in terms of experience, training, education, work settings, and application. They provide the context for interpreting the results. So um, we looked at some of the, de the demographics, specifically the ones that indicate that the sample was representative of the profession in terms of experience, training, education, work setting, and geographic location. So um, the data that we um, achieved from the occupational analysis report showed um, a nice uh, representative sample here. We have our zero to five years, we have 23%. And as you see, more than 20 years old is 33%. And then we have six to 10 years, 21%, and 11 to 20, 21%. So it's a nice balance 
13% were independent contractors or associates, 11% multidisciplinary group, 9% chiropractic group, house also visits 2%, and hospital less than 1%. Number of hours worked per week, we see that um, 22% were 40 or more hours, which is the majority were 21 to 39 hours, 52%, um, 11 to 20 hours, 16%, and 0 to 10 hours, 8.9 hours. Um, other professional licenses held, the most common one we um, was reported was extra supervisor, and then there were acupuncture certified athletic trainer, naturopathic doctor, and now remember, these are just in our sample. This may not necessarily represent the population. Uh, similarly, diplomat certificates or degrees held, we asked them. And um, this is the breakdown. Uh, the highest one, 39%, was uh, sports medicine, then physical um, therapeutic rehab, neurology, diagnostic imaging, radiology, occupational health, chiropractic pediatrics, nutrition, orthopedics, chiropractic. This is the geographic region um, breakdown, and um, we see that as most of our surveys, L LA County has 26%, San Francisco Area 21%, San Diego 10%, Sierra Mountain Valley. So we got a good distribution across all of the areas of California. So the task ratings, there was um, two scales, a frequency scale that asked how often you perform this task to treat patients. And um, the scale of zero that does not apply to my practice, I never perform this task. Five means very often I perform this task almost constantly, and it is one of the most frequently performed tasks in my practice. And there was also an important scale for the task. How important is performance of this task in your current practice? Is it not important, does not apply to my practice, or is it critical? Similar uh, knowledge ratings um, were on just an important scale. How important is this knowledge and performance of your current practice from zero not important to five critical? So identifying the critical task of knowledge. So um, we compute what we call a critical task index, meaning and it's um, determined by each task, you multiply each respondent's frequency rating times their importance rating, and then take the mean value across all the respondents. And we use this um, index to review the data from the task and ensures that estimates can evaluate the task criticality in terms of both frequency and importance. So in other words, both frequency and importance contribute to the critical index. So tasks that are very important but perform less frequently, such as reports of suspected abuse of a patient, you may not do that very often, but it's very, very important. So those are key as critical. If we only use frequency, that may would have dropped out. So for knowledge, the critical index is simply the mean importance rate. So in the workshops, SMEs use the critical index values to determine if any tasks or knowledge should be eliminated. And um, so during the final focus group, we looked at the ratings, SMEs reviewed the ratings for each task and knowledge, and then we asked them to set up a cutoff point. Is, are there any tasks um, on this list that are rated so low that you think they shouldn't be in the description of practice or tested on an exam? And um, in this case, we had, when we were developing the task and knowledge, we like to be inclusive. So there are areas of practice that might be a little peripheral or people in our SME said, you know, not a lot of people do this, do we think we should put it on? And when we're developing the survey, we say yes, put it on there, and then the survey data will tell us if it's um, practiced very frequently or not. So we did that with some areas, and as it turned out, some of them received very low rates. So the things that were eliminated based on the SME judgment were um, paraffin therapy, Whole body vibration therapy, ionotopheresis modality, whirlpool hover tank therapy, cupping, and extra corporeal shockwave therapy. So those, it, their ratings were very low on those, and it was determined that um, they should drop out. Not that they're not part of practice, but they're just not important relative to all the other things that we have covered. So, what we ended up with um, the description of practice. Based on calculating the importance of the criticality weights, um, we review the criticality weights based on the survey data, then we have the, the subject matter experts review it to see if it makes sense to them, 
and let them adjust it a little bit to make sure that it matches what they believe is um, representative of the practice. And so we came up with these four content areas. Patient history um, was given 14%, examination assessment 29%, treatment 26%, and laws and regulations 31%. So one of the results of the OA is the specification of the weights for these content sections of an examination, or it can be called the restriction of practice since you're not developing an examination um, based on total practice. And so we um, they also had a focus discussion, um, like I said, about the weights to determine if they adjusted in a very small way. Here's a description of each of the areas. So patient history covers um, assesses again the acknowledge of performing comprehensive patient evaluation, examination and assessment, assesses again the acknowledge of performing physical examinations and evaluations to guide diagnosis and management. Treatment is the kind of knowledge of chiropractic treatments, including the use of physiotherapy modalities and healthy lifestyle counseling, and then laws and regulations. This area assesses can acknowledge of laws and regulations related to chiropractic practice, as documented in the California Business and Professions Code. California Code of Regulations, California Health Safety Code, and Chiropractic Initiative Act of California. So then we took that last um, content area, the laws and regulations content area, because uh, your, your board uses a national examination and has a California specific law examination, we took the law and regulations content area and um, determined the preliminary weights what we expect them to be for your CCLE or your law and ethics examination outline. So we broke that down further into its own examination outline, and that came out to be records management 26%, business management 26%, ethics 26%, and scope of practice 22%. And the descriptions of these are records management, assesses the county's knowledge of California laws and regulations related to documentation, maintenance, and release of patient records. Business management assesses county's knowledge of California laws and regulations related to ownership and management of high practice businesses, corporations, and practices. Ethics it assesses candidates' knowledge of laws and regulations of professional ethical conduct in chiropractic office advertising and examinations. And scope of practice assesses candidates' knowledge of California laws and regulations related to chiropractic scope of practice. So uh, the next steps. So we are still, um, even though the occupational analysis is done, um, we're now working on developing new questions and examinations um, based on the updated occupational analysis. Um, the next step, we're also in the process of reviewing the national exam, the NCPE examination, to ensure compliance with professional standards and guidelines. And then the final um, step in our um, project is a lineage study to confirm content areas covered on NCPE and CCLE. I'll explain that a little more. So, um, the national, um, the national examination did their own occupational analysis, and it's um, their subject matter experts are all across the country. So um, our process, this is why we did the full occupational analysis of your practice. We will do a link study to compare the full occupational analysis with the NCBE occupational analysis to determine if there are any areas other than the law and regs, which we know are California specific, but if there's any other areas that are not covered on the national. And sometimes that happens where there are, in some professions, there are practices that are specific to California um, or emphasis, more emphasis on certain practices. So when we do the final link study, we'll determine if we need to adjust or add to anything to the CCLE examination model. Also, um, the
supplement, additionally, uh, was that included in the original contract price or was that a supplemental contract to have the analysis done? What you're talking about, what analysis this, are you talking about? Specifically, the, the linkages. I'm, you know. oh, we're, in the pro we're in the process of doing that project. It will be a separate report. So that's separate from the original contract? Yes. Okay. And then my next question is, do you have an idea as to when that will be completed? By the end of the year. By the end of the year. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, Patty, I just wanted to clarify. You said that's a separate report, but that's part of the entire contract, right, for the occupational analysis. This isn't a separate contract to do the... the you don't have two contracts. So, but... You, you, you already, we already have it. Yeah, so it's not, it, it's Julie Vance, your question, it's... It's included in the price. That yeah, the price. yeah, the price. The, the yeah, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the, I was looking for the time frame and the report specifically and the financial responsibility. Thank you. Any other questions? For the students, there we go. For the students that are still here, we have a couple of uh, items of business that we're going to do before we break for lunch. We have some committee reports we're going to give, um, then we're going to break for lunch. And just so you know, what's going to happen after that is we have petitioner hearings that, at, that will start around 1 o'clock that you guys may want to be here to hear. Um, and then after that, we'll go into closed session. So there's a couple committee reports that we'll do before we break for lunch. It's going to be a few more minutes. I, I think that this is such a great meeting for students to be at. You can see our processes um, and the contrast from the speaker we had earlier today. Uh, we do in-depth analysis. We make sure that our exams and the qualifications for our licensees are up to date. And uh, I appreciate our previous speaker from the PMA. I appreciate the differences of uh, hearing differences of opinions and different points of view. I just want to let everybody know that um, we encourage speakers, we encourage t open discussion, um, but our, our board in no way is, by having the speaker here, is endorsing the PMA. So we're gonna move on to uh, item number 11, update on governmental affairs and our public affairs committee. Is that you, Mr. Rufino? All right. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll try to give you a quick update from the most recent government and public affairs committee meeting. The government and public affairs committee met on July 11, 2017 to review and discuss the strategic plan action items delegated to the committee. At that meeting, the committee discussed possible changes to the board member administrative procedure manual and as well as the annual legislative meet and greet meetings that we have uh, been doing in the past. We were also provided with an update on efforts to increase public awareness of the BCE. And finally, we received a copy of the board's updated outreach presentation. So quickly, um, the first time, let me go make quick comments on uh, each one of these. The first one is with respect to the email ballots and for the students' uh, uh, interest, uh, the board must approve any proposed decisions or stipulation before the formal discipline becomes final and the penalty can take effect. 
So proposed stipulations and decisions are emailed to each board member for his or her vote. For stipulations, a background memorandum from the assigned Deputy Attorney General accompanies the email ballot. And then we have a two-week deadline generally is given for the email ballots for stipulations and proposed decisions to be completed and returned to the board's office. So in that respect, what are we asking is to <clears throat> board members, we have, revised, we, have, we have received clarification regarding that process and that procedure in the manual. And uh, to, to make it easy, we ask, well, sorry, we, there is a reference in your uh, board packet. Uh, staff has included a reference page to page 10 of the manual where the section on the e e email ballots can be found. So if there is any, if board members should have, uh, should determine that there is a better way to deliver these board actions for consideration, please be sure to let us know. Make sure that you let uh, either the committee or the executive officer or the chair know. Mr. Fino. Yes. Ask, just ask for clarification on that. Do you mean uh, if there are better ways to deliver the board actions, you mean email versus conventional mail is that what you're talking about correct or okay. if there is a better way um there seem to be or a contact person or contact or, or or somehow if we need to if you can if we can figure out the, that pro if we can improve that process in any way please let us know okay thank you um the other question is about the or the other issue that we review was the annual am i too loud the annual legislative meet and greet and that deals with the strategic plan goal 3.2. So as I said in the past, we've been meeting with, uh, we've been having a meet and greet at the Capitol uh, with various stakeholders, such as the Legislative Business and Professional Committee, the Minority Republican Legislative Office, with the Consumer Services, the Housing, uh, housing Agency, and so on and so forth. At these meetings, board members and staff provide meeting attendees various board publications such as consumer pamphlets, strategic plans, newsletters, etc., highlighting the major accomplishment from the previous year and also to discuss any emergency, emerging, emerging challenges or issue in the future. So and although these meetings have been extremely successful, the committee believes that a more strategic approach is needed as we, as we move forward. So instead of annual meetings that have become routine and may not provide the stakeholders with new or compelling information, the committee voted to end these meetings and move to a strategic approach where committee members and staff meet with stakeholders as needed to address pressing policy issues. So the, com the committee believes that this new approach is the most efficient use of time for both the board and stakeholders alike. Any questions on that from any? Lastly, an update on the increase, um, an update uh, on the efforts to increase public awareness on the BC. That's a strategic plan goal 3.1. Uh, we'd like to know that on June 22nd, 2017, the executive officer met with the DCA Deputy Director of Communication to discuss ways to increase awareness of the board through the utilization of social media. Bear in mind that without a large budget or the authority to travel around the state to participate in outreach opportunities, social media has become the board's most powerful tool to reach consumers. This meeting allowed the executive officer to hear possible solutions to the longstanding issue of, law con of low consumer engagement and how to begin to reach a larger audience. The meeting was very successful and I'm not sure if the executive officer wanted to add any comments um, no but um, thank you I, I just I want to thank Department of Consumer Affairs um, specifically Veronica Harms for me taking the time to meet with us she's the deputy director for communications and um, they they offered us some very good suggestions and um, and their their support so um, so we've already started implementing some of the recommendations they have for um, you know, keeping um, you know a, con a content um, like database, and where we have um, information ready that we can share on social media and um, and updating and refreshing it regularly. Um, so um, we'll we'll continue to work closely with them. And um, just again, thank you to Department of Consumer Affairs. Question. Um, 
to that note, Robert, I know that in the past we you had um, recommended uh, eliciting uh, content from other doctors. If you want to extend that to the doctors then? possibly the students who will be graduating soon? Uh, yeah, um, thank you, Dr. McLean. Very good mm -hmm. suggestion. Um, you know, anybody out there, anybody um, here in the audience or watching us um, on our webcast, uh, you know, if, you, if you have information that you think, um, of course, we're, we're a state regulatory agency, so we can't just share anything related to chiropractic. Um, but if you have something that you think would be useful for the chiropractic profession to know or um, for consumers to know about chiropractic, you can forward that um, information to the board. And um, we'd be happy to um, look at it and run it by our attorney if we need to and you know, see if it's appropriate for sharing. And then, um, yes, it's certainly that's something that we could share on Facebook or um, Twitter. And you know we want to we want to get information out there and um, and be part of the sharing of information. So um, so anybody that's interested, please let us know. I I have one more question, Robert. So are the ideas that you got from DCA are those written down anywhere, or is it just given to a staff member and it's just going to be institutional knowledge that hopefully gets passed down? How is that being handled? Uh, we're going to um, make it, this is a relatively new um, role for some of our staff. You know, we in, a few years ago we didn't have a social media coordinator, so um, so it's it's going to be part of the procedures for um, for that desk. As I mentioned earlier, we're in the process of process mapping um, all of the um, all of the tasks that are performed in the office. So this will be in the procedures for that desk. So written down in their, their yes. okay, description. Thank you. I okay. just have a couple comments on that also, um, Mr. Rufino. Um, the, the point around um, increasing uh, public awareness of some of our works, specifically I want to go back to the item that was in our meeting minutes, and I apologize I was unable to attend the May 17th meeting because I was teaching that day. But I noticed that there was something, uh, and I followed up with Robert on this, but I want to follow up with you as well. Um, the introduction of CCA's new executive director, Don Venton, and the director of government affairs, uh, Julian Hacker, she specifically mentioned that CCA publishes a weekly newsletter and stated that she would look forward to working with the board um, and offered to distribute the information. I'd like to make a recommendation that the Public Affairs Committee, which is now merged with the Government Affairs, take as an agenda item to develop a 12-month communication plan, specifically uh, working with CCA as to what it is that we would like to have distributed through CCA. And I think a 12-month plan or an 18-month plan um, would allow for both organizations to be clear as to what's coming. So I just wanted to put that as a recommendation for your committee. Yes, thank you for that recommendation. And you may find uh, that the next item that we talked about was to develop, to create the creation of a calendar of chiropractic events that take place throughout the state that sort of it's in line with what you're saying. And that's a specific strategic plan action item 3.1. And at our last committee meeting, we did discuss with CCA to and to try to get all their events in our calendar and try to come up with a mass a statewide chiropractic events calendar. That's where we are calling it. And our staff has begun that process and it's been in fact, if I'm not mistaken, there should be uh, a sample, uh, a sample. Marcus, right, in, with the, in your packet. Mm -hmm. So if, uh, and if we can, well, that's a start, of course, and if anyone has any suggestions, we can enhance that and make that more comprehensive, of course we will do that. But May I make a suggestion to have that be a Google Doc so that people can add things to it? It is, it is already? Okay, thanks. Uh, can, I, can I also make a suggestion about that, that uh, not only reach out to CCA, but reach out to the schools. They have events that are going on um, locally. I think some of the licensees ha know of events that go on in their areas as well that they can contribute but not just cca but i think it's important to reach out to the the schools um as well as some of the other associate like in, like national board fclb they all have events that could be put on the calendar as well that are opportunities for the board to uh participate of course and i'm sure there's students representatives and school representative in the audience that take notice of that to contact us 
or any events that you think will uh, uh, we can include in our statewide uh, calendar by any means uh, we we would love to hear from you that person is uh, well either our executive officer or our staff that's directed uh, probably the, the executive officer would be best so and finally uh, we got an update on a public outreach presentation uh, those of you who are CCA members I'm not sure if it, there's still some in the audience you probably got a chance to see it uh, my understanding is although I was not present that we presented that new presentation at the CCA convention in San Diego Again, we asked CCA leadership to uh, take a look, and if there's anything that we can in, in do, if there's anything that we can do to improve or to change or to add, we are certainly more than willing to hear any any suggestions uh, to make the presentation better. But we do that fulfill strategic plan action item 3.3.6, which is uh, which requires the creation of standard presentation for uh, board members to deliver. So I promise to be brief, because I know everybody, uh, that will conclude my presentation, uh, unless there's any questions. But before I do that, I want to thank uh, our uh, Dr. Corey, who is my fellow committee member, and as well as the staff for their input and their support of the committee. Thank you. Any questions? I just have, I, uh, I looked through the presentation, and I think it's, fantastic we've been asking for it for a long time so thank you thank you thank you to Heather Robert the committee the staff working on it I do have some suggestions that I'd like to follow up offline to um, make it less wordy more visually appealing Excellent. okay thanks yeah. so noted all right thank you mr. Rufino huh? and uh, thank you to the governmental affairs and public relations committee for your work and I'd like to move on to the enforcement committee uh, for their report. Okay, and I promise to be even briefer, Mr. Rufino. Is that a word? Briefer? Briefer. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. That's in your blue packet. So there's a supplemental packet that was uh, provided to you. Uh, the folder. Uh, the enforcement committee met on July 19th, 2017 uh, to review and discuss the strategic plan goals assigned to the committee. The committee had a discussion on possible changes to the enforcement data presented at BCE meetings, uh, which uh, Robert generally includes in his uh, executive officer report. And we also discussed the development of public outreach materials regarding the BCE complaint process and the possible adoption of a code of ethics. Um, additionally, we discussed potential enforcement issues resulting uh, from the social media activity. So regarding the enforcement data provided, staff put together a fabulous packet mm -hmm. comparing variety of different uh, metrics there um, we previously uh, about a year ago board members expressed an interest in providing more data um, to effectively monitor statistical information inform stakeholders of the board's progress for these meeting enforcement goals the committee uh, discussed the purpose of this possible revision and considered efficiencies to streamline the enforcement statistical process in an effort to provide transparent Enforcement data, the committee reviewed the BC enforcement performance measures, which is the Q2 report that's provided in here, and determined it'd be beneficial to have this uh, annually presented at the meeting. I, I don't believe we need to have it quarterly. I think annually would be more than sufficient, and uh, the document speaks for itself. It's very easy to understand. So, any questions on that? Go ahead, Julie. I, I don't have any questions. I do have some suggestions, though, for comparability purposes. My suggestion was to, is to have like year over year data included or three year rolling averages, something like that. If there's an anomaly with a year over year comparison, a three year rolling average allows for a little bit better understanding as to what's happening. Um, I love the, first of all, I love it. You know, I'm a data freak and geek, so I love it. Um, I also want to say, you know, on some of these, which I think are terrific, we've got target days and then actual days. To the extent that we can incorporate a target number or a standard or a best in class on many of these, I think it would be helpful. So those are my two suggestions, either the year over year comparison or the three year rolling average, and then also where appropriate to, to incorporate the target or standard. Dr. Elgener, um, 
just uh, on those performance measures, that, that's something that every board within the Department of Consumer Affairs does. It's the, um, uh, and it's, um, this was prompted by the legislature, I believe, and so the, um, the department's looking at uh, the performance of all of the boards, and so those documents, and we could certainly create our own, um, modify that for purposes of sharing that information with the board, but, um, but we can't really modify those documents if we're just sharing the, the department's performance measure reports. So I might then suggest we pass along those, those recommendations to the department then, because clearly they have the data, it's just a matter of how it's presented. Okay. Yeah. I, Anything else regarding? Yeah, I just have a question about performance measure, the probation violation response cycle time. Uh, it's the very last, very last page, very last box. So it says average number of days from the date of violation of probation is reported to the date the assigned monitor initiates appropriate. I just want one day. I don't understand the chart um, and how the appropriate action is defined. So one day seems like a pretty short period of time for them to have action taken on a probation violation. So I'm just. I, I just don't understand the chart, I think. This, um, well, yeah, and this, because this doesn't give actual numbers, um, it, it may be, and I, I don't know um, off the top of my head, but it may be that we only had one um, case be assigned to the monitor, and we have one enforcement monitor office in our office, Christina Bell, and she's on top of it. Um, she's she knows all of her probationers and she's got quite a few and um, and as soon as she becomes um, aware of something she acts on it she um, you know, so so it's highly possible that if there were only one or a handful of um, of you know uh, what you, uh, sorry the assignments to the monitor it's highly possible that Christina did <laughs> reach out to them in one day as just when the staff person reaches out. Yeah, it's to, so it's initial contact. When initial somebody contact. gets put on That's probation, yeah, then then it gets assigned to Christina, and from the time she gets it, um, you know, if she's out of the office, it may be two days or something. But oh, no, uh, but on average, she's, on she's I yeah. Just didn't, I didn't know that you, that was meaning initial contact. Yeah. That's all. Okay. That's all I wanted to know. Okay. Thank you. Anything else on that? So the next topic is development of public outreach materials regarding the BC complaint process. So the development of outreach materials educating the public regarding the BC complaint process has been an ongoing topic of discussion with this committee. The committee reviewed complaint brochures from other boards. Um, thank you to staff for, for putting all those together. We discussed the efficiency of complaint procedure and the possible ways to disseminate the BC complaint process to the public. Um, we also discussed putting a video online at the board website to oh, walk good... people through uh, how to file a complaint. Uh, the committee will develop a comprehensive overview of the complaint process and will provide guidance to filing complaints. Uh, we were also discussing disseminating brochures to chiropractors so they can have in their office. Um, certainly, I think that's a good idea. There's going to be some practitioners that are going to be a little concerned yeah. to have complaint brochures in their own office, but um, I hope that most of us would shy away from that and realize that we're providing a service for anybody to you know, file a complaint with any practitioner, should they wish. Um, we also discussed handing those brochures out to young students and whatnot. The efforts really need to be placed at how do we educate the public on how to file a complaint, and so I think the best thing in that regard is going to be to make a streamlined procedure when members of the public go to the website, whether it be a video, whether it be a uh, you know, PDF. We also discussed uh, the importance, in my opinion, of stating on there that people can be anonymous if they wish, although that's you know oftentimes not possible, but to uh, not discourage people from filing, filing a complaint because they're worried about any retribution. Good, Julie. Question? Mm -hmm. It's not really a question so much as it is a, a suggestion for us or maybe for us to take to DCA. I think we need to think a little bit more broadly about Google word search terms because I don't think 
that people necessarily would know, consumers necessarily would know, let me go to the board of chiropractic examiners dot ca dot gov to be able to issue or to be able to file a complaint. But rather if DCA was thinking more about Google terms and Google word search terms, that would be across the state of California for, you know, if, if a consumer wants to file a complaint, I would suggest we put some efforts or make some recommendations there that, that um, would help across all of the boards. That's a good point. I'm not suggesting don't, don't, you know, have our efforts at our own board level. That's not what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting like take it to the next level, you know, around keyword search terms and some of those kinds of things that, the, that would benefit consumers across all the boards. Anything else? Next is adoption of the Code of Ethics. Um, strategic Plan Goal 2.2 is to collaborate with the Professional Association to establish a Code of Ethics that promotes higher ethical standards for licensees. Um, we reviewed the CCA's Code of Ethics, the ACA Code of Ethics. I, I believe CCA is going to be working to modify the Code of Ethics since it was uh, quite antiquated. Um, ACA's was much more streamlined, um, but we, the committee, determined that it's not really our job as a board to enforce the code of ethics. We have the laws of the uh, of the state, um, as we so eloquently discussed an hour ago, that uh, should guide our our practitioners, and we will let the associations, uh, you know, try to motivate the licensees to follow their code of ethics. But we don't want to endorse a particular code of ethics that may lead to some confusion on what is truly legal and not, not legal. Any questions on that? Comments? And lastly, um, enforcement is issues resulting from social media activity. There's two great articles in your packet here. Um, I believe they're available out there. Strategic Plan Goal 2.4 was developed to inform licensees about enforcement issues related to social media. So social media, as most of us know, is a powerful tool for licensees to establish and grow their practice. However, sharing patient information on social media has become a serious problem as licensees are faced with a higher risk of violating HIPAA laws. Um, certainly, I think this has some generational uh, components to it, and fortunately we're here at a school with a younger uh, demographic here that understands social media and how it can be a fine line of sharing very valuable information, but we still need to always respect and uh, maintain confidentiality. Uh, the committee reviewed articles related to HIPAA violations on social media and plans to develop an outreach uh, materials or develop outreach materials to inform licensees about these issues. Future BCE newsletter articles will address case studies of HIPAA violations, the five to 10 common mistakes that are made, and the importance of developing an appropriate risk mitigation plan to help eliminate these potential violations. Additionally, the committee uh, proposed promoting the attached articles, um, as I stated, that are available. Um, one being uh, stemmed around the Yelp mm -hmm. issue, and yeah, another good. one which uh, provides greater guidance. So it's very good that was good. On, you know, what needs to be kept in mind. So at this time, there are no recommendations, no action items um, for the committee to bring forward to the board. I, I have one comment just about the last. These articles are, are excellent and they all deal with HIPAA violations, but one thing I would um, encourage the committee to take into account when dealing with social media is also um, establishing a doctor-patient relationship, maybe unknowingly on social media, where someone makes a comment about a problem and all of a sudden you're giving advice, you haven't examined the patient, you know nothing about their history, and now you've established unwittingly or unknowingly um, a doctor-patient relationship online, that can be a problem too. So just wanted to bring that up because it's not really addressed in these articles, but these articles were excellent um, at talking about HIPAA and, and the pitfalls there. Thank you very much for providing those. Yeah, I encourage all the students to get a copy of those. If not, let us, um, I think somebody on staff here has a copy, but you certainly should read those. Can I answer that? Doesn't that go into telemedicine a little bit on social media? Well, right, right but it still has, still has to right. do with no, social I media, and, and I, think it, I think there should be some portion of it included in whatever outreach agree. publication we do. And I think we found our first a good, uh, good social media um, outreach uh, post that we can do is uh, HIPAA on social media. So I think <laughs> those are great articles, so yeah. very good. Well, I, I think from a student perspective, I think it's important for 
all of you to understand that you cannot render advice as a layperson anymore once you become a doctor. You, you will always be a doctor. You're always going to be held to that standard. And so you just need to be very careful, whether it's over social media, whether it's over a telephone call, whether it's uh, in a bar or at Starbucks. Um, if you're giving advice, you're giving advice, and it's going to be construed as professional advice, and there's going to be little that you could do to hide behind that opinion later. Anything else? All right, thank you. All right, any public comments? All right, we are going to break. Um, we'll have an uh, administrative law judge, a court reporter that will be showing up around 1 o'clock, and we'll start petitioner hearings then. So we encourage you to come back. Thank you. I will be calling uh, two cases to order. There are separate cases involving petitions before the board. So the best way to think of what will happen next is a small uh, formal proceeding within the board meeting. So I will now uh, call to order the matter of the petition for early termination of probation of Sharon Brown, D.C. It is case number S1-2014-1002. This matter is before the Board of Chiropractic Examiners, and I will ask uh, the board members to please in, uh, state their names for the record, starting to my right. Sergio Azlino. Heather Dean. Frank Rufino. Dion McLean. Julie Elginer. Corey Lickman. And my name is Samuel B. Reyes, and I am an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings. Appearances by the parties? Uh, yes, representing the people of the state of California, Deputy Attorney General Thomas L. Rinaldi. Yes, good afternoon. Scott Harris on behalf of the petitioner, Sharon Brown, who is also present and to your left. Thank you. Uh, before we went on the record, uh, I reviewed the exhibit to be introduced uh, with the parties, and I will now formally mark as Exhibit 1 the following documents. It contains uh, an application, of cover letter, application for petition of termination of probation, and uh, the petition itself, and it's numbered pages 1 through 118. So this is marked as Exhibit 1. Is there any objection to the receipt of Exhibit 1 into evidence? Uh, the only objection I would have would be that with respect to the various letters submitted by Dr. Brown that they be classified as administrative hearsay. Is it Not better? Yeah. My objection, um, such as it is, would be with respect to the documents, uh, the letters in particular submitted by Dr. Brown, that they be classified as administrative hearsay. Yes, so th that objection is well taken. Uh, so administrative hearsay is a shorthand uh, for how certain documents are treated. If they are letters or other documents written by someone who is not present, they may still be received into evidence to explain or corroborate other direct evidence, such as the testimony of Dr. Brown. So with that limitation, uh, Exhibit 1 is received. Thank you. And so now I will turn to uh, Mr. Rinaldi uh, without altering the burden of proof in this matter. The burden of proof lies with the petitioner, as it is the petitioner who is seeking something from the board. Nevertheless, I'll ask uh, uh, Deputy Attorney General Rinaldi uh, to uh, make a brief presentation. Thank you. Yeah, this will just be a brief overview of um, Dr. Brown's license history with the uh, Board of Chiropractic Examiners. Uh, she has license number 15480, which was issued in 1983. Uh, following a series of forfeitures for failure to pay, to timely pay renewal fees, it was ultimately canceled in 2003. That same year, um, Dr. Brown filed a petition for restoration of her license. However, the board denied the application 
which the petitioner appealed and which resulted in the filing of Statement of Issues number 2014-1002. Statement of Issues was filed as a result of several misdemeanor convictions sustained by the petitioner between the years 2005 and 2012 as follows. 2005, she was convicted of driving while under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Um, that was vehicle code section 23152A. Hit and run driving uh, in violation of vehicle code section 2002. And finally, willful cruelty to a child in violation of penal code section 273A. All three of the aforementioned convictions uh, were classified as misdemeanors. 2009, she was convicted of one felony count of violating penal code section 476, which uh, underlying conduct consisted of writing uh, checks with insufficient funds. And then finally, in 2012, she was convicted of penal code section 459, um, which is burglary, and penal code section 487 classified as grand theft. Uh, both of those were misdemeanors, uh, misdemeanor convictions. The statement of issues was resolved through a stipulation that resulted in the restoration of her chiropractic license, which was immediately revoked, stayed, and placed on probation for three years on certain terms and conditions. Her probation is currently due to terminate on January 2nd of 2018, barring any probation violations. Pursuant to the June 19, 2017 memorandum that was included in each of the board members' packets, uh, there have been no known violations of her probation to date. And with the documents having been submitted, uh, I would like to turn this matter over to the petitioner for her to present her case in chief. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Your Honor, Madam Chair, members of the board. We wanted to thank you first for your time and consideration today, as we know it is very important, uh, and the role that you play in regulating chiropractors is paramount in uh, protecting the consumers and the healthcare industry. Ms. Brown, or excuse me, Dr. Brown, comes before you very humbled by the experiences of her past, and through the exhibit packet that has been admitted, and through her testimony, you will find that she is not only humbled by her experiences, but has also been empowered by them and comes before you seeking relief from the probation that she has now served for more than two and a half years. You will find that the conviction suffered occurred in 2005 uh, with events that occurred in 2005 and 2009, uh, that all three of the convictions have been fully expunged and that Dr. Brown is furthering her practice as a chiropractor has fully complied with your probation and looks forward to moving on without a cloud above her as she empowers herself moving forward. Um, if we can, I would ask uh, Dr. Brown a few questions and then turn it over to the board for any questions that you may have. Dr. Brown, if you would please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. Please state your name. My name is Sharon Brown. Council. Thank you very much. Dr. Brown, when were you first licensed as a chiropractor? April 1983. And you've just heard from Mr. Rinaldi that at some point you allowed your license to lapse. Uh, why did you allow your license to lapse? At the time I was a, a stay-at-home mom and I was raising children and my husband was, uh, was a very controlling person and I uh, said you will be a stay-at-home mom, and uh, that's what I had done. I might suggest I, you. I cannot hear. Oh, you can't hear me. Rephrase. Re-answer. Re I got what I could hear. Okay. If, if, if you need to ask a follow-up question, you, you certainly can. That would be the best way to clear it. Thank you. No problem, Your Honor. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Thank you, Madam Reporter. When you allowed your license to lapse, what was your primary objective uh, in life? At that time, and, and now, I was, yes. um, my primary objective was raising my children and being a stay-at-home mom and running the household. And um, my husband was a spine surgeon, and he was very busy practice, and I was running our household. And that was my priority, my children, and volunteering at the school and um, staying at home with the children. 
In 2013, why did you wish to gain your license back? Uh, at that time, I was trying to reorganize my life and get back into my career I had studied for here and, um, and went forward with that. Now, at the time of your application in 2013, do you recall being initially denied? I'm not sure I recall at that time when I was denied. Do you recall generically that your license application was denied? Yes, I think I did. And we have just heard from Mr. Rinaldi that in 2005 you suffered a DUI. Do you recall that conviction? Yes, I do. Can you briefly tell the board the circumstances of the DUI that led to the three charges of DUI, willful cruelty to a child, and hit and run during that conviction? That morning I was going to take my children to a book signing of a friend of mine at the local high school and I had had a cough for the last week so I, I, I cannot hear a thing. I had taken okay I had taken cough syrup with coating in it and I had driven the, I was on my way to driving the children to the book signing and um, swerved off to the side of the road and got out and my 16 year old son drove back home and then I was then arrested for the DUI on cop syrup. To be very clear, did the conviction involve alcohol itself? No. Have you been ever accused to have an alcohol abuse issue? No. Have you had any other convictions that have involved alcohol or drugs? No. When was the last time, in fact, that you drank alcohol? Um, three years ago, Pat, before I was on probation, even six months before that. As part of probation, have you been monitored for alcohol or drug intake? Yes, I have. And uh, have you ever failed a test? No, I have not. Mr. Rinaldi also outlined for the board that one of the reasons for your denial was a 2009 conviction for writing checks with insufficient funds. Can you please tell the board generally what led to that conviction? Um, <clears throat> I was. Um, to speak up. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I had been married 15 years. I was used to my husband controlling all of our finances, writing all of our checks, taking care of all of the bills. I then got divorced and um, and uh, was then I, I met someone else and then they had taken over all my finances and we were engaged and he had um, said I will manage all of your funds and I didn't realize I wasn't getting alimony or child support because it was getting directly into my account at the time. And I really honestly wasn't paying attention and I really should have been. I just had no clue that what my balance was and um, I had been uh, kind of trusting and kind of stupid and naive to allow him, uh, the men in my life to take over like that, like my parents did and my grandparents did. And, <clears throat> and I will never let that happen again. Now, in 2012, you had a second conviction for grand theft and burglary. Do you recall when the underlying incidents for these two convictions occurred? I do not know the exact date. It was just all at the same group of checking, I believe. And when you say it was all about, thank you. Can you hear me OK? Would it be better for you? Um, may, 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 maybe. Me? <laughs> let's, let's try. <laughs> that way you have it closer to you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for your patience as we work through this. Okay. When you say that the 2012 conviction was all part of the same grouping, do you recall if the underlying incidents for the 2012 conviction were in 2009? And did they also resolve, revolve around the issuance of bad checks? Yes, they did. And was the reason for the issuance of those bad checks the same as you articulated a few moments ago as we spoke about your 2000, 
and nine conviction. Yes. In reflecting upon these convictions, what have you learned from them? I have learned to um, never allow one to control my assets or finances ever again like that, even though my oldest son wanted to help me out with uh, managing them, I said no. And I've um, learned to be more of an empowered woman running my office again like I did in 83 and setting a good example to my children and the young students out behind me um, to just be strong and not get in any kind of trouble and be aware of all of their, everything they're doing all the time. And um, trying to, you know, just, I, I would really like to set a good example to my children. And uh, I just learned not to ever let someone, or uh, to, just to watch it myself, watch my own um, banking statements myself. And, Since you gained your license back two and a half years ago, can you tell the board what you have been doing? Um, yes, for the past eight years, I've actually been working uh, as a food server. And um, <clears throat> since I got my license back, I've been working with uh, Dr. Mark Mascheit in uh, Del Mar, California, San Diego. And he's allowed me uh, to work in his office when he's not there and uh, back um, with some of my patients from 20 years ago coming to me and building up my practice again. And I'm actually feeling like I'm a better practitioner than I was many years ago because I can relate to people and make some of the things they're going through. Um, <clears throat> and I also work with uh, several elderly people I know. I give them rights to their doctor appointments and um, help them with different chores, like helping a dog for them. Um, anyway. Can you tell the board why you wish to be uh, off of the probation that they ordered? Well, um, I feel like I need to go forward and put this all behind me. That's um, not who I am, writing like bad checks or um, you know, driving under the influence like to go forward and take this cloud of events behind me and move forward so I can work on my practice and um, help others. If you could say anything to assure the board that these types of events will not occur again, what would you say? Um, well, this time in my life, I'm 60 years old, a lot of my friends are out babysitting their grandchildren now. I really um, don't see there, how there could be any worries about me. Um, in that department, like I said, I am taking care of my own finances. Uh, I have four children. I want to set an example to them. Um, I have three boys and one daughter who's 24. I especially want to show her to be a good example. And um, just go forward with this and be able to um, be an uh, insurance provider. Thank you. At this time, I think Ms. Brown would be subject to any questioning by Mr. Rinaldi and or the board. Mr. Rinaldi, do you have any questions? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Just a few questions. Uh, Dr. Brown, with respect to the, um, the check writing incident, so if I understood your testimony correctly, are you saying it was the fault of your new boyfriend rather than any malfeasance on your part? So you're saying there was no intent on your part no, to commit a crime? No, there was no intent on my part. So if that's the case, why did you ple plead guilty to the crimes? I'm going to object, Your Honor, as the relevancy is why someone has uh, pleaded guilty or accepted a particular plea is irrelevant to the context of the fact that she has been convicted and that it has now been expunged. 
rehabilitation is the issue here. If she's not accepting responsibility for her conduct, then well, arguably rehabilitation hasn't been established. The objection is overruled. The questions do not go to the issue of the existence of the conviction, but would be permitted to assess rehabilitation. Uh, if you have the question in mind, you may answer it. If not, we'll have it re-asked. Well, the question was, if you, you're saying the, the crimes for which you were convicted were not due to any bad intent on your part, why did you plead right. guilty? And the, you know, the pleadings that describe these convictions aren't factually developed, so um, let me ask you, were you given the opportunity by whoever was the recipient of the bad checks to make good on them? Yes. Did you do so? Yes, I No, at the time that the insufficient funds came to light, were you contacted by whoever you wrote the checks to to say, look, this check didn't... That was part of a criminal probation term, I assume? No. I, I don't know. I'm just trying to I'm sorry? I went on my own to try to get And okay. despite that, criminal proceedings followed? Despite that, I think they did. Dr. Brown, can you hold that a little I closer, think, please? I think, yes. I'm not exactly recalling everything at that time. Okay. You understand rehabilitation is really the primary issue here with respect to whether or not the board is willing to reduce the term of your probation? Yes, I do. And as you said here today, is it your contention that you're fully re rehabilitated? I am rehabilitated. And at what point in time would you say that you were completely rehabilitated? I think with time, I've been working on this for the last, since I was convicted of this, to um, rehabilitate I was trying to make a, a temporal distinction. Uh, um, when, at what point in time? So, what point in time do you consider that your rehabilitation was complete, such that you did not feel you needed to be under the disciplinary jurisdiction of this board? Five years ago? How long, when was the probation initiated in this case? So at the time you signed the stipulation to the statement of issues, did you not feel that discipline of any nature was warranted? Well, it's your testimony that you were rehabilitated approximately five years ago, but it's been less than five years since you were placed on probation by this board. So. Did you not feel at the time you signed the stipulation to be on a three-year disciplinary probation that it was perhaps not justified? Again, I'm not really sure what you're asking. Um, That's okay. I feel I'm rehabilitated from writing any kinds of bad checks. I have um, the bank manager go over my account with me every two weeks. Um, Teresa and she looks at it with me and I balance it together with her so I am totally rehabilitated from that issue. Okay, thank you Dr. Brown. Board members may have questions as well. Do the board members have questions? <coughs> Hi Dr. Brown. I am just looking at bait stamp 49. And, and for, for, for the record, uh, would you please state your name? Sergio Azzolino. Um, so, bait stamp 49, I believe through 67, controlling blood sugar for health, weight, balance. What exactly is this document? I had just attended a seminar on this subject because um, I, I was interested in it. It was a seminar I attended, and those are the notes from it. Okay. And have you currently been practicing? 
And about how many patient interactions uh, daily do you have? Um, it's a small practice at this time, possibly. Um, I'm doing four a week right now, five to week, a week, uh, sometimes more, sometimes less. So <coughs> roughly one a day? It's usually on one day, usually on okay. Tuesdays today. And are you still working as a food server? Okay, and how many hours a week are you doing that? Um, I don't have an exact amount of hours that I can think of right now, maybe um, 20 hours a week. So if the board were to grant your early termination of probation, how would that change your practice? I would, be, I would uh, grow my practice, quit the food serving job, and feel more freedom to go forward with my practice and be able to have um, maybe a posture seminar in the office uh, and, and build it up to more patients than that. Okay, do you feel that the probation is hindering that? Um, it can be, it's kind of over my head and um, it feels uncomfortable to just know it's there and also the uh, Occupational random drug test. I, I can never plan a day until the morning, whether it could be four or five hours taken out of your day. You, you can't really plan each day. You don't know if you're going to be called in. So it's a little bit of a hindrance, yes. Okay, thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you. Any, anyone else? Hi, Dr. Dion McLean. Um, I have just a couple of questions. Um, regarding um, your technique, you said you've been practicing again now for about two years. Yes. Um, and one of the areas um, of the exam that um, seemed to be very low was your technique. What are you, what have you done or what are you planning to, what have you done to um, increase or improve your technique skills since you were not practicing for a very long time and now you're practicing again. What are you doing to stay abreast of that? Um, at times, when I'm in Dr. Mashaik's office, I will, he will uh, show me techniques and things that he's doing. He's very up to date with a lot of brand new equipment. We'll compare notes and side by side, and I will watch and hear some of his techniques and learn from him. And also um, going to my renewal seminars every year, sometimes more than um, required, and discussing with um, other chiropractors that I know my colleague, Dr. Fran Wallace, who's in here, um, will discuss techniques. I'm what, not sure up to date. What was the last seminar that you attended that um, was on technique? That would be my relicensing seminar. I think it was with either Dr. Zimmer or Dr. Fortius, and they always have fun to make at those uh, seminars. Okay. Um, that's it for me. Thank you. I'm Dr. Julie Elginer, and I just have a quick question, also a, a follow-up question to Dr. Azzolino's, which was found on Bates, uh, on page Bates Stamps BCE 55. It's, it's pertaining to the notes that were included from Valerie Hall. I just wanted to better understand the purposes of including these notes. Were they part of a, these materials? Did, do you know the page? 55 is what yes. I was referring to? Yes, okay. I see the page. So were these part of a, seminar that you attended or I'm just trying to get a better sense for why these I'm, were included. I'm sorry, I, I, I just was including, um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Or no, is that off somehow? It's going red, sorry. Um, I was, uh, when I would speak with um, Christina Bell from the probation office, she, she would mention too, um, you know, go to, I think that she was asking to include any kinds of additional seminars on the probation paper every, that you fill out every uh, few months. Okay, 
and on the quarterly report. So it was just a seminar I took. One of my sons has diabetes one, and I was highly interested in it, just to learn, just to Got keep it. learning, not to. Um, I guess the reason that I was asking is that these documents, there's zero citations that go along with it in terms of, you know, um, being able to verify any of the claims that are in here. So as a researcher, you know, at a university, I'm just skeptical of the information that was included, specifically because I can't, I can't research any of these claims that are being made. I see. I understand. I was just going to learn more information, okay. not to hold it to any kind okay, of a... That, that's what I just wanted better clarity as to why these materials were included. Thank oh. you. All right. You're welcome. Hi, Dr. Brown. Hi. Dr. Heather Dane. I have, um, I just have three quick questions. Um, how many, do you know how many hours are required each year for continuing education? 24 hours okay. a year. And um, where, are you currently practicing in an independent office or are you only practicing in the office of the chiropractor you told us about? In the office of the chiropractor I told you about. So you see his patients when he's not there sometimes and then you see your own patients there too? No, just my own. Just your own patients? Yes. Okay. And then, um, when is your probation scheduled to be over? I think it's January 2018. Okay. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Any redirect? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Brown, you had a discussion with Mr. Rinaldi about whether you take responsibility for the convictions that you suffered. As you sit here today, do you take responsibility for the conduct that led to those convictions? Y yes, I do. And when you were discussing the circumstances that led to those convictions, were you at all trying to blame anybody else, including your ex-husband or prior fiance? No, just myself. Can you? Make sure that the board understands that they that you know what you did wrong at the time. I know what I did wrong, um, in that I just wasn't paying attention to my balance and my checkbooks and um, paperwork, and instead allowed someone else to, and I'll never have that happen again. It's it's very scary, very embarrassing. It's not who I am. I've never had anything like this happen before in my life, except that time of the, that time in history of my life. Thank you, I have no further questions. Any recross? No recross. Right, so now we'll move to the final phase of the uh, hearing, and that is closing argument. Um, I'll start with uh, petitioner, as petitioner has the burden in this case, and we'll give the opportunity to conclude. Council. Thank you very much, Your Honor and members of the board. We appreciate your time in considering this petition to terminate Dr. Brown's probation early. First and foremost, your role is to make sure that she is safe and rehabilitated, and we believe that the evidence demonstrates that she is. All three of her convictions have been expunged as required. She takes responsibility for her misconduct, misconduct that occurred in 2005 and 2009, <coughs> respectively. Now 12 and, pardon me, eight years old. She has sat here today to try to convince you that she understands what her failures were, and I think most telling is that how she has learned to empower herself from these events to make herself an independent woman to rebuild a career, and to be a role model for the students behind me, for her family, and most importantly, her children. We would hope that you would acknowledge that she has fully complied with the terms of her probation. She has continued to see a therapist who has submitted a letter, Dr. Irene Cornish, for your consideration, demonstrating that she is continuing to grow and takes full responsibility and has remorse for the conduct that has led her here today, and that she has the support of other colleagues of yours in her continued practice of chiropractic. 
We hope that what we would demonstrate is that for the last two and a half years, she has demonstrated a rehabilitation, a competency, and a safety to practice, and that there are grounds to terminate her probation early so that in her own words, she can lift the cloud that hangs over her. Thank you. Mr. Rinaldi, people will, people submit. Very well, uh, thank you both. Uh, that concludes uh, the hearing and the matter submitted for decision. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, everybody, we're about to start the second hearing. All right, uh, so let us uh, go on the record. This is a hearing in the matter of the petition for early termination of probation of Kerry Woods, D.C. It is case number AC 2013-978. This matter is before the Board of Chiropractic Examiners of the State of California, and I will ask board members to please state their names for the record. And this time I'll start on my left. Frank Ruffino. Dr. Dion McLean. Dr. Julie Elginer. Corey Lickman. Dr. Heather Day. Dr. Sergio Azalino. And my name is Samuel D. Reyes and I am an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings. Appearances by the parties. Uh, yes, good afternoon board members representing the people of the state of California, Deputy Attorney General Thomas L. Rinaldi. Carrie Woods. And uh, I will mark uh, for the record uh, as Exhibit 1 the petition and accompanying documents. They have been, they have been bait stamped numbers 1 through 35. Is there any objection to the receipt of Exhibit 1 into evidence? Uh, only objections would be those uh, discussed in the previous matter. Uh, any letters I would uh, classify as administrative hearsay. And so exhibit one is received into evidence and uh, any letters contained in the exhibit by a writer who is not present, which would be any letter except any that you may have written, uh, are received as administrative hearsay, which means that the, the content of the letter must attach itself to something else that is said here today, other direct evidence can only be used to explain or supplement other direct evidence. So in, if, if your plan is to testify, keep that in mind. If there's anything you want to present or highlight based on what others have stated in their letters, feel free to do so. So I will now turn to uh, Deputy Attorney Rinaldi uh, to make uh, some opening remarks. Thank you, Your Honor. As Judge Reyes stated previously, this matter concerns the petition for early uh, termination filed by Dr. Carrie Woods. Uh, Dr. Woods received license number 21571 in January of 1991. Accusation number 2013-979 was filed on December 19th of 2013 which alleged violations of chiropractic laws and regulations with respect to um, or as a result, I should say, of two convictions sustained by the petitioner as follows. On July 17, 2013, he was convicted of one misdemeanor count of driving on a suspended license. Uh, earlier that year, on March 7, 2013, he was convicted of one count of driving a motor vehicle under the influence of alcohol in violation of Vehicle Code Section 23152. 
Uh, it should also be noted that the accusation that was filed also alleged as a disciplinary consideration a previous alcohol-related misdemeanor conviction uh, classified as a wet reckless, which occurred in 2005. Uh, that accusation was resolved through a stipulation that resulted in the revocation of his chiropractic license. Uh, the revocation was stayed and the petitioner's license placed on probation for three years, effective May 2nd of uh, 2015. Petitioner's probation is currently set to expire on May 1st of 2018, barring any probation violations. Um, Pursuant to a June 19, 2017 memorandum, which is included in the board packets, um, Dr. Woods has been compliant with his probation with no current violations to date. Uh, it's also worth noting that the petitioner currently has an outstanding cost recovery balance of $1,017.50, which should be considered when uh, issuing your decision on his petition in this case. Documents having been uh, admitted into the record, I'll now turn this over to Dr. Woods to present his case in chief. Dr. Woods, uh, I would give you the opportunity to make brief opening remarks before presenting evidence, but if you want to do both at once, I will administer the oath now. That way you don't have yeah. to repeat yourself or don't forget to say something while under oath. Do you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Please state your name. Carrie Woods. Now, you may testify in the form of a narrative. That way you could tell the board what you wish the board to know in your own words. I would caution you to not go too fast. Um, the court reporter might be able to keep up with you, but I'll need to uh, keep notes as well, and some board members may be taking notes as well. The other thing is, if you hear the word objection emanating from the table next to you, uh, please uh, stop. Let me hear the basis for the objection. Then I'll make a ruling on the objection and direct you as to whether you could proceed. Okay. okay. And uh, the third thing, uh, based on our experience earlier in the day, be mindful of the microphone. Uh, yeah. Try to stay close to it um, and uh, to, make, to make sure that we all hear you. Okay. okay. So you may begin. Well, first of all, I would like to um, thank you for the opportunity just to have this, uh, even have this opportunity of petitioning uh, for early termination. And I, I appreciate the efforts of the board. Um, the reason why I believe that uh, early termination for myself is warranted is because um, I, I feel rehabilitated. I, 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 the remorse level is, I, is so high that I would say it's affecting my health. Um, emotional level of being distraught has just given me nightmares, sleepless nights, disappointment in myself. I could go on. Um, the last five years of my life I've had extremely little amounts of alcohol since the incident, which was in 2012, um, and nothing to drink whatsoever in the last 815 plus days, whatever it is exactly. Um, and I've respected that with, with due diligence. Um, I love my job, I love my profession, I, I respect it, I know I made a mistake. I think there's a point where a person uh, can benefit from discipline and there, there's a point where you can cross a line and the discipline can can start to you know weigh so heavily on you you don't know what to do um, but I appreciate the discipline it, it, it's changed my life I've, I've helped so many other people so many patients of mine um, with their issues uh, that may involve alcohol or drugs or whatever it may be. I've never had any, any problem with drugs. I've never even used a drug. I'm pretty anti-pharma. But, um, and in the classes that I had to take, state mandated classes, um, there's 20, 30 people in there and they frequently had me speaking to the class because I, I, I'm a motivator. I, I love to help people and the, and the teachers saw that. So. They even assigned me to AA classes to go speak. I didn't get any credit for it. I did it on my own. I just, because I felt so bad, I felt I should help people. And I know I made a mistake, so, and at the same time, being in this profession, I know how to help people. That's my job. 
So I kind of used that to my advantage and, and, and got some nice stories from that. So over this time, um, uh, I've learned a lot. Um, my family's learned a lot. I'm raising a, a, a daughter who's coming up on the legal age of drinking and she's got the utmost respect because she knows what happened. And, and I, I think that's great, actually. Um, the only thing that is, is re the one of the one things that's really difficult, difficult about all this, and I'm sorry, I'm extremely nervous, and I also smashed my hand in a car door yesterday, so it's like one of the worst things a chiropractor can do. Um, so I'm in quite a bit of pain. Um, is that it's difficult, it's difficult on my wife and that just hurts me pretty much the most because we're very spontaneous in our marriage. We've been married 32 years and, and we love to just take off on a Friday afternoon and go somewhere and do something. And you can't really do that when you have to call in and then you, your whole day could be changed because you've got to go get a test. So that's, that's been really difficult for her. So I, I'm looking forward to being able to, to travel with my wife again and, and renew that part of our marriage together. And, and uh, like the previous petitioner said, it, it feels like a cloud over you. you. You don't like it, but you understand it. And um, I look forward to, to uh, happier times ahead. I'm writing a book too. I don't know if I, I, I think I mentioned that in my petition. Um, I'm a quotes guy. I love quotes. I make up quotes every week. And I think I'm going to put them all together and, and write a book and, because I think this experience can help other people. So that's, that's one of my, uh, I guess you could say that's one of the things that happened to me from all this is it's led to some good. I don't know that I might have much else to say. Cross-examination. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Uh, Woods. I don't good have afternoon. many questions for you. Um, I guess the primary one I do have is um, since the standard by which the uh, board is um, will decide your petition for early termination, in this case is rehabilitation, uh, what rehabilitation other than remorse can you point to um, that the that the board can rely on uh, to be assured that public protection will not be sacrificed by terminating your probation uh, a full year early? Well, uh, first and foremost, I've never in my 26 years of practice, I've never had alcohol at, in, or around my office, ever. I've never had alcohol before I treat a patient, during treating patients, maybe after on the way home with dinner. but. I've always respected that every year of my entire practice. And this incident of me getting a DUI has nothing to do with me uh, during you know, patient treating time. So you know, I, I'm pretty confident that, that patients are safe that way at least. I, I know that the, the experience of a DUI doesn't speak highly of you and it, and it is your character. But I can say proudly that nothing's ever happened at my office and never will. Um, I've complied with the probation. Um, I, I, not drinking alcohol, to tell you the truth, was the easy part. <laughs> the hard part is, is calling in every day. It's almost like Chinese water torture. It just, <laughs> it just you, you can't, you know, because sometimes, you know, you walk out the door and you're like, did I turn off the coffee pot? You walk back in, and of course you did, but you just, you know, it's the same thing with the phone calls. It, it's, that, that, that part is difficult, but I did it. I did it. I got through that, and, and um, even this morning, called again, I did it. Um, I'm consistent. Um, in the past, between the uh, time this event happened and the probation from the state board, I was allowed to drink. But even at that time period, I, I uh, made a drastic reduction. I, I, to tell you the honest truth, I've never had a problem where I felt like alcohol was in any control of me whatsoever. Um, I learned in these classes with, uh, that are mandated by the DMV that um, it almost feels like they treat each and every person with a DUI like they have an alcohol problem, and I mean problem like they're addicted to it. And um, I wouldn't say that I resented that, but I wanted to kind of prove that that, that wasn't me. So, so I was pretty proud uh, that I was able to stop and not you know, have any problems with that whatsoever. Um, 
And it can't be too much harder for a person who is a sommelier. I don't know if you know what a sommelier, but a sommelier is a person who's an expert in wine. And I've been a consultant in the wine industry before. So staying away from something that I really enjoy and have read hundreds of books on, you could say, wow, what could be more difficult? But I did it. So I think that's pretty strong evidence that, that I've you know, uh, been rehabilitated. Um, one more thing I would say too is that between the time period of getting the, having the DUI happen and then being um, uh, under probation from the board, I took Uber. I never drove a car, uh, you know. I mean, if I had a beer in, at lunch, 5 p.m., I still wouldn't drive, we'd do Uber. And we, that's a great service, I have, to, <laughs> I have to say I'm pretty thankful for that. And we're used to it now, so even though I don't drink, my wife does, we still use Uber. Well, with regards to the conduct underlying your conviction, you apparently told the arresting officer that you'd been wine tasting and uh, that you'd had uh, approximately eight samples that day. Is that accurate? Wow, that's a long time ago. That would be, that would be a typical wine tasting session, yes. Because my understanding is your blood alcohol level at the time was a .14. Uh-huh. So those must have been some pretty generous pours. Is that right? You, I guess you could say that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Woods. No sure. further questions. Questions from uh, board members, starting to my left? No questions. Um, sir. Oh, sorry. sorry, just to clarify. So and you, you oh, sorry, Dr. Dion McLean. Um, so just to clarify, you, um, decided to abstain from any alcohol on your own. You never attended any programs at all on a consistent basis? I did for the DMV required classes, yeah. I was put on an 18-month um, offender, I forget what they call it exactly, it, it has an SB in it, but one of those, cl I did classes every month for 18 months, and I got outstanding marks on all that, but during that time period, I was still not under sanction from this board, so I could still drink but it was extremely minimal. My car had a, uh, an interlock device placed on it, and so that, you know, you can't drive, you know, with anything, so that was, that was actually kind of a nice restriction to have. It was already teaching me a lesson. And you are currently practicing now. Yes. So tell me how would removing or uh, giving you this early termination in your probation, how would that change your practice now? I think, I think it would change my practice in the sense that I would be happier. I would feel relieved of burden and to be able to come home and see my wife happy and relieved, you know, that just changes your whole world. And when your whole world is, is better, your practice is better. You can go in and practice on a Monday morning after a bad weekend and, and you see it hurts your practice. But when you're up and you're, you feel like you're part of society again and an upstanding citizen, it, it changes everything. And um, most importantly for me, um, you currently have a remaining balance. Uh huh. Can you tell us why you have not paid that? Um, because it's a payment per month and I make it every month. So it must be there's remaining months to pay. Is that why? Yeah. Well, that's what we're trying to figure out. Part of your pro, part of, if we were to grant you early termination, you would have to, that has to be resolved. Are you prepared to resolve that? Can resolve it today. I have nothing further. Dr. McLean asked my question, so I have nothing. May I ask a question real quick? But, um, oh, no, oh. Not yet, not yet. Okay. Let's follow this over. I have no questions. I have no questions. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm looking at bait stamp 24 here, and it says that the court ordered respondent to complete an 18-month offender drinking driver program, a 52-week domestic violence program, and was ordered not to annoy, harass, threaten, or disturb the peace of RW. Is that in reference to you here? Yes, it is. And what was the circumstance around the, the domestic circumstance violence? The circumstance of that is that on the DUI stop, um, 
my wife was extremely angry. There was, a, I wouldn't really say it was an argument between us. It was, to make a long story short, just something she was severely dissatisfied about. She was intoxicated and in her anger, injured herself in the car. When the police pulled me over and saw her bleeding, that's, I, that's like I picked up that charge. And I told them and she told them that we were not, that it had nothing to do with me and they still charged me with that. And then when it came to the time for court, the, my lawyer said that they would not give you one or the other, it's gonna be both or nothing and you're not going to have the DUI dismissed. That's when they said the only way to fix that would be to go to trial and it was more money than I could handle and I said, what do I have to do? So that's what I just, you know, okay. picked it up and did what I had to do. I have no further questions. Judge, may I follow up? You, you, you will. Uh, in, in the following sequence, uh, I'll give you now the opportunity to provide additional testimony, not to ask questions, but to provide additional testimony if, if you have any, anything else to say. I don't have anything else to say. Right. Now you may cross-examine. Thank Further you. Now, this is just a follow-up to Dr. Azzolino's question. You were, in fact, convicted as part of that case of um, spousal battery in violation of Penal Code Section 273A. Isn't that correct? Yes. For some reason, it didn't make its way into the accusation, and I can't explain that. But uh, so now the record's clear. He, does, he was convicted of that, and if further proceedings were ever brought, that conviction could be uh, alleged as a disciplinary consideration, despite the fact that it was not in the accusation that resulted in the um, probation that he's currently on. So I just want to make that clear. Thank you. All right, so we'll now move to a closing argument. Well... Um, again, I thank you for the chance to, to uh, offer my testimony, and I, I do um, uh, petition your, your leniency and your, your understanding of my request, and, and um, I look forward to the future as a chiropractor in the state of California. Mr. Rinaldi? Uh, people will submit. Thank you both. Uh, that concludes uh, the proceedings, uh, and the matter is submitted. Thank you. So we're adjourned. You good? Yeah, yeah. If I can get a, I don't. If I can get everyone's attention. I don't think, oh, there we go. If I can get everyone's attention, we're gonna go into closed session um, while the administrative law judge and our uh, deputy attorney general, Mr. Rinaldi, are here. Um, we have to discuss the cases that were just presented and some other things in closed session. After that, just so you know, we're gonna talk about pending regulations and, um, and our regulation changes to our um, license application. That's what's coming up after the closed session, if you want to hear about that. But we'll be in closed session for a bit, so um, everyone's going to have to clear out while we're in closed session. All right, we're going to go back into open session and go back to the agenda for our last couple of items. We just left closed session for a discussion of the, uh, the petitioner's cases. So we are on to item number 13, update and discussion on pending rulemaking. So if you want to know all the things that the board is working on regulation-wise, the list is in the packet or online. Um, those are all the regulations that we're working on. And just as a background for you guys that are here, um, we know that licensees, at least, that we deal with think that the board meets and then like makes a decision and then it becomes some kind of new rule. That's not, not what it takes. Just to change our license application, we've been working on it for 
how long? Two years. Two years just to change the license application. And that's not even a regulation about the way you practice. So it's a long process. We make up language. We have to give reasons for why we're changing it. It has to go to the Office of, Office of Administrative Law, and they have to approve it. There's a public comment period. It is a long, long process. So there's no reason that anybody should be surprised by um, something new that comes to the board because it's years in the making. So this is about our uh, our our regulations that are pending and uh, what status they're at. So, Marcus. Good afternoon. There you go. It's on. Good afternoon. The board. Now it's not on. How about the other one, Marcus? Good afternoon. Get a hello. It's not meant to be. Just, Just talk. Give the wire. Thank you, Let's go. You, you don't need to say good afternoon again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, good afternoon. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah, market. Third time the charm. We currently have 10 regulations that we're working on. Um, there's one currently actively uh, being worked on. There are five that are in various stages of completion, and four that will be um, that are in the hopper that we'll work on shortly. Um, our application for licensure and CE regulation. Um, we will make our final board adoption today and submit that for review at OAL for a final approval in the next 30 days. Um, our CPEI and uniform standards are currently being worked on, um, but we have not initiated the, the process on this. Um, and then the rest of the regulations are at various stages of review at the board level. Do you guys have any questions? I have a question, Marcus. Is the CPEI, Consumer Protection Enforcement Initiative, and the Uniform Standards, um, are, are you working on language? And like, reason, what, so what's, it, it, why haven't they been submitted yet? So there's like, uh, uh, following the disapproval of the application, um, yeah. I wanted to make sure that any changes that were necessary with that regulation were incorporated into this so that we're not reinventing the wheel. Awesome. I want to make sure it's done. We only have to submit it one time. Perfect. That's what I want to know. Thank you. That's it for me on 13. Okay, so 14 now? Of course. And so. And just so everybody knows, 14, agenda item 14 is the review and discussion and possible action to adopt or amend rulemaking Title 16, CCR Section 321 and 364, which is the application for licensure. On July 7th of this year, the board, or the 15 day comment period ended, um, receiving one supportive comment from the CCA. So I just wanted to give you guys a heads up that the board, that the board and staff have accepted their comment. It's positive. Therefore, we do not need to make any changes to a regulation. And so I would ask that the board adopt the regulation. Um, the, I would ask the board to adopt the rulemaking package, amend, which amends the language, the ISOR, and the accompanying documents related to the application and CE regulation, and to also authorize the executive officer to make any non-substantive changes to complete the rulemaking package and submit it for review and final adopt final approval by OEM. So, 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 Yeah, they, they have to adopt it. Okay. Yeah. So can I add that? Can we amend it and add Absolutely. that? Absolutely. So first, we'd like the board to adopt the comment, the supportive comment from CPA, and then adopt the rulemaking package, which contains 
the minute language ISO, ISOR and accompanying documents related to the application of CE regulation and duly authorize the executive officer to make any non-substantive changes to complete the rulemaking package and submit it for review and final approval by the way. So moved. I'll second. Any discussion? Any public comment? Call for the vote. Azalino, yes. Dane? Yes. Rufino? Yes. McLean? Yes. Alginer? Yes. And Lickman? Yes. So what's the next step for this? Goes back, does it go back to OAL? So we have to resubmit the package to the Department of Consumer Affairs through agency, um, and then once we get that approval, then we'll resubmit to OAL, and upon receipt from OAL, they have 30 days to issue uh, an approval of denial. How long do you think it will be with DCA? We hope it's an expedited process because it's already been this long, and um, we have a short window left on the 120-day submission to OAL. So we'll deal with that starting tomorrow. So what's the... How, you know. um, I've been assured by the um, staff and, and the regulation staff at DCA that if we need to, there's an extension that can be issued to make sure we are able to submit within the one hundred twenty days. Within 20 days. So there will be no issues submitting it on time. Earlier. Okay, so first DCA and then OAL. Then agency and then OAL. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to public comment for items not on the agenda. Any public comment? Going once, going twice. Uh, how about future agenda items? Board members, any future agenda items? Uh, from the public, any future agenda items that you would like to see on our agenda to be discussed? If you think of something, again, you can contact the board through our website and uh, let us know, and we'll try to get it on the agenda. Okay. So thanks for coming back for that. We're going uh, back into closed session because we have some disciplinary um, decisions to discuss. So after that, will adjourn our meeting. So I want to thank you all for sticking out to the very end for you, not the very end for us. It's been a pleasure for us to be here at SEU, and uh, your college has always been gracious and uh, very hospitable to us, uh, very responsive, and we can not tell you how much we appreciate it. And we really appreciate having some face time with you guys. You guys seeing what the board does, um, our, Everything we do is publicly, publicly transparent. If you go on the website, you'll see uh, the, the minutes for this meeting and every other meeting we've had, um, committee meetings, board meetings. If you want to know what the board is doing, there's no reason why you shouldn't know what they're doing by looking at our website. So I appreciate your attendance. And uh, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to Robert Puglio, our executive officer. Thank you very much. Or Marcus. Or Marcus.